great. All right, great. So I think it's time. So uh, let's get started. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the other uh, SAS SIP meeting entitled Early Galaxy Formation Near and Far. The SOC and LOC members listed here have prepared this meeting. I'm Masami Ochi from Tokyo, chairing the other uh, organization committee. So first, I explain the aims of this meeting. Space and ground, ground large telescopes have revealed many high-Z galaxies at the epoch of reionization, providing the various questions, whether star-forming galaxies are responsible for reionization and what the physical origins of high ionization lines and high equivalent with objects. Now, a lot of high-Z astronomers come to the low-Z universe and study local dwarf galaxies as analogs of high-Z young galaxies. Here, we aim to promote the, uh, the discussion between observers and theorists, as well as high-Z and low-Z astronomers, that of whom have obtained great results of local dwarf galaxies over decades, and also to understand the connection between local dwarf galaxies and high-Z galaxies, which will be very useful in the era of JWST, hopefully launched next month, exploring galaxy formation up to the first galaxies. Now we have you, great participants here. There are a total of 238 people who have registered. You are in a variety of time zones, Europe, US, Middle East, East Asia, and Oceania. We see a great balanced mix of career stages. There are a total of 60 presentations consisting of 44 talks and 16 posters, recorded talks. So the presentations are given in the Zoom and recorded talks appear at YouTube uh, a few minutes after the talk. And the questions can be made in Zoom and Slack. So you can push the other uh, button of the raise hand in Zoom, or you can write up the other uh, your questions on the Slack. Okay, we have sufficient time for questions and answer. So we really encourage questions from students and young astronomers, and CD questions are very welcome, which stimulate our discussion, and uh, your questions are key for the success of this meeting. So we have the, uh, the, the, the opportunity of the interactions twice in a day uh, at 2.10 and 3.30 uh, every day. And uh, we prepare the, uh, the breakout rooms for the speakers, post a recorded talk folks, and you can move to a Zoom breakout room, pushing the button here. And uh, you can choose the other uh, speakers or presentators, uh, you know, pushing the join button. Okay, yeah, that's it from me. So have fun over this week. So do you have any questions? Are you happy about this? Okay, if no questions, then let's start the other, the other, the first, uh, the, let's get started. So uh, Ricardo, first speaker is the other, we will move on to the other uh, talk, invited talk. The first speaker is uh, Ricardo Morin from La Serena. So Ricardo, when you're ready. Okay, please. can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my, my screen? Yes. Okay, that's great. So good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Um, I would like first uh, to, to thank Masami and the organizers of this uh, wonderful series of meetings. And, and also for the invitation to, to speak today, especially in this uh, opening session, it's a great honor. So uh, I'm gonna talk about observations at, uh, of low Rashif analogs of radiation galaxies uh, with an emphasis on some lessons we had learned on the early phases of galaxy evolution and chemical enrichment from uh, the, the most extreme mission line galaxies and the role they may have in, in cosmic radiation. So, uh, I will, I will uh, start introducing uh, 
Uh, two of the major themes that motivate, uh, for instance, the JWST and the, the giant telescopes, telescopes to come for, for galaxy uh, formation studies. And one of them is, is focused on the, on the major questions around the first galaxies and the need for improving uh, our understanding of the early phases of galaxy evolution and how uh, uh, young galaxies were able to realize the universe during the first billion years of, of cosmic time in this epoch. So um, for this, it's essential to understand uh, which type of galaxies of objects uh, produce the required uh, ionizing photons and how these photons are able to scale. Um, okay. So a, a second, a second uh, theme, uh, which is quite related, is, is focused on how galaxies assemble over, over cosmic time. And this requires a, a very understanding of the mechanisms uh, driving and regulating the galaxy growth. So to address these major questions, uh, um, different observational constraints are needed, both uh, from statistical samples and also from uh, detailed observations of key objects, which could provide insight into the key uh, physical parameters like uh, star formation histories, chemical abundances, kinematics, and, and others, which are essential. So uh, um, the approach of finding uh, low redshift analogs of these high redshift galaxies may provide us with uh, uh, useful insights on these topics. So in the last few years, this approach has gained a lot of momentum and a great deal of observational effort has been invested on this. So this produced uh, amazing results that we will uh, revise during, during this meeting. So uh, during the last decade or, or so, uh, uh, deep surveys have, have shown that the first galaxies should, should have more extreme properties compared to the more normal galaxies at lower reshes. So this means that they tend to show higher uh, star formation at lower metallicity and with uh, 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 little impact of, of dust, which uh, may imply uh, uh, very high equivalent widths in nebular lines, as is evident uh, uh, from different studies. So for instance, here I show uh, the, the typical uh, SED for, for a very distant galaxy, showing this uh, indication of prominent, very high equivalent widths initial lines. Uh, so um, works like, for instance, uh, those from Smith et al, or, or faced uh, have shown the, uh, uh, a significant increase of the equivalent width of, of the of the of the uh, optical lines, um, especially H alpha and also oxygen three with redshift, uh, in line with the increase of a specific star formation rate with cosmic time as well. So, in average, uh, also studies morphological studies show that galaxies become more compact as they, as they uh, go to uh, higher redshifts. So these conditions are average uh, uh, for statistical samples and more detailed analysis allowing a more insightful description of the physics of such galaxies will of course require JWST and, and, and the ELTs as well. So huge efforts uh, to get high quality spectra from these uh, young galaxies have allowed us to understand some point uh, that such uh, string conditions may result in, in high equivalent width in several uh, key UV emission lines as well. So which are, which are somehow key to describe the physics of the ISM interstellar medium in these galaxies, such as the, the ionizing radiation, the gas temperatures, or the densities. So these results are, are very promising, especially for, for JWST uh, and, and looking for, for lower redshift analogs with similar properties may provide us useful laboratories to better understand this, these conditions. So analogs of, of reionization galaxies at, at slightly lower ratio and intermediate ratio around cosmic noon are not possible with, uh, uh, with uh, deep surveys, uh, in particular in, in cosmological fields. And I show here to a couple of samples uh, um, from, from Boots, uh, galaxies with a very strong uh, uh, Lyman alpha emission and also very strong UV uh, nebular lines, which looks very extremely compact of a few hundred parsecs in size. And another uh, well-known example of perhaps the, the, the one of the first uh, uh, detections, direct detection of Lyman continuum, significant Lyman continuum escape uh, at this, at this, at this redshift. So these objects are generally low mass, compact, uh, and display a, a young starburst at low metallicity, which is evident from, from the spectrum. 
So analogs of ionization galaxies at this redshift are also uh, uh, strong IMR parameters. And here I highlight a, a recent work by, by Jory Mati and collaborators that uh, uh, studies uh, a representative sample of LAEs uh, using high quality spectra and show their stream properties. So it's interesting uh, that LAEs appear still rare at, at redshift two among the LDG population, but they can be somehow representative representative of, of uh, uh, towards, more representative towards the, the reionization epoch. So in this work, the, the authors propose uh, two extreme pictures uh, uh, to, to, um, to understand the, the, the Lyman alpha properties of uh, the Lyman alpha emission of these objects and show that uh, a low high uh, H1 column densities are possibly, possibly favored by, by a, a favorable viewing angle or depending on the viewing angle plus uh, the, the, the uh, a low dust content may allow the escape of ionizing photons uh, from a young uh, burst of star formation here with young stellar ages. Uh, using this sample and, and, and a reference sample of Lyman continuum emitter from literature, two recent papers by, by uh, Naidu and, and Mathi propose a scenario where low mass uh, galaxies at a relatively uh, bright LAEs could lead to uh, ionization. This is a scenario, the LAEs are, are highly efficient ionizers, uh, showing extreme ionizing production and, and large scale fractions, which occurs uh, apparently in synchrony. So this implies uh, that a few temporal phases, which uh, uh, leave uh, clear signatures in the UV spectra, in particular in, in the Lyman alpha uh, uh, profiles, uh, are then uh, connected to, to the ISM properties uh, shown by LAEs uh, uh, with low and, and high SK fractions. So I'm sure Rohan uh, will describe this in more detail uh, uh, later, so I will not uh, spoil his talk. And I will go uh, to, to, to the local universe, to come closer, where we find the green peas, which are probably the best uh, low redshift analogs of, of such bright LAEs. Uh, the piece uh, uh, show extreme emission line spectra in the optical, as I show here, uh, reflecting the environments of uh, young star clusters without, uh, uh, very, uh, without the, the influence of an evolved underlying population. So their, their spectra is basically dominated by, by the nebular emission. So the green piece have attracted a lot of attention since the last decade because they are somehow convenient laboratories to study the, the UV properties of extreme emission line galaxies in good detail, especially with HST. So as a result of these observations, we were able to resolve uh, their stellar morphologies uh, and also uh, uh, discover and study a variety of Lyman alpha shapes and, and their implications. But the really game changer was, was the discovery of Lyman continuum emission from most of the Greenpeace observed so far we caused uh, at the HST below the, the, the Lyman limit here. Uh, so this provides us with a unique tool to gain insight into the processes that allow Lyman alpha, Lyman continuum photons to escape. Uh, however, after, after a large amount of work addressing uh, the key question of what properties uh, favor Lyman continuum photons to escape from different angles, um, the, the small statistics uh, perhaps and, 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 the, and the different sources of uncertainty makes the answer uh, quite inconclusive uh, so far from, from the, at least from the observational perspective. So there are a good number of uh, parameters that appear related with leakage and possibly uh, the most promising ones are, are those in, uh, related with the shape of the Lyman alpha emission and, and the ISM uh, properties related to, to, to that. So this is a major, a major problem that the, the low redshift Lyman continuum survey is addressing uh, uh, now uh, using a, a unique data set collected by COS uh, uh, in, in, in 160 orbits with HST. And this survey is, is testing key Lyman continuum indicators that will be testable with JWST at the reionization epoch. Uh, and the diversity of the sample will help us to understand the existing relations and their scatter. So combining these uh, results with the prediction from models and simulations, 
the various uh, uh, ongoing analysis uh, uh, will provide a new insight into the, this, this complex uh, problem. So uh, I think the first results will be covered uh, by Sofia Fleury and also Albert Saldana in their talks later. So I will not go in, uh, more into these details, but I will focus now on an, interest, an interesting piece of, uh, of the puzzle uh, when addressing the nature of these analogs, uh, um, which is the ionized gas kinematics. In an earlier work, we showed that even though uh, uh, we could not resolve the H2 regions in Greenpeace, uh, at least for optical images, we can uh, uh, use high dispersion spectra to resolve their gas kinematics. And this led to interesting findings because it turns out that the Greenpeace have uh, complex line profiles which require multiple components with a uh, highly supersonic velocity dispersion. So, Indeed, the, the, the presence of, of broad emission in Balmer and also collisional excited lines with velocities of a few hundred kilometers per second suggests the presence of a very strong turbulent ISM and star formation driven outflows. So this is interesting uh, because strong feedback from massive stars and eventually supernovae are needed to clear paths from which Lyman photons are able to escape. And several uh, uh, detailed simulations show uh, um, these and, and also the most common models uh, also assume this. So the question is whether we can extract uh, useful quantitative constraints to inform models uh, and better understand these, these predictions. So first clues uh, were, were obtained uh, from one leaking candidate uh, here, I, I show here, this is a, this is a very uh, a relatively massive and, and, and very compact Green P with a strong double peak Lyman, uh, Lyman alpha emission. And results from this analysis using high resolution spectra show again the presence of this broad emission, sometimes blue shifted, which is consistent with, a, with an unresolved uh, outflow, which contributes significantly to the total flux of the lines. So the typical velocity dispersions are consistent with, a, with an outflow velocity of a few hundred kilometers per second. So not extremely uh, strong. And this is evident also when we compare the, the, the outflow velocities uh, from the, 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 the H alpha uh, or from the optical lines from those obtained from the ISM absorption lines in the UB uh, straight by, by, by COS here, I, I showed the comparison, uh, also overlaid to the, to the double peak Lyman alpha emission scale with the, with the H alpha model. Um, so using this multi-component model, uh, we, we can study the properties of the broad and the narrow emission using line ratios. And we find that this gala in, at least in this galaxy, the broad emission appears uh, denser, slightly denser uh, with lower electron temperature and, and, and lower excitation compared to the narrower emission. This is, this is intriguing. And it has also served to discuss the potential impact of this uh, complex kinematics in our interpretation of the unresolved observations, uh, especially in classic uh, diagnostics like these ones. So of course, we need larger statistics uh, to say uh, whether this may or may not affect the scatter uh, in relations involving uh, light ratios. Um, uh, in the thesis of uh, uh, one of our students here in, in La Serena, Matias Rodriguez, we are now proving the kinematics of the ionized gas in a sample of Lyman continuum emitters. And the first results that will come uh, soon, uh, uh, and I anticipate here, uh, provide a very, very uh, uh, nice results and confirming somehow previous works on, on Greenpeace. So the presence of a, a substantial broad emission, sometimes blue shifted, is again here and is consistent with outflow velocities of a few hundred kilometers per second in these in this, in this leakers with uh, escape fractions more or less uh, uh, of, of around 10%. So this is relevant since uh, feedback is needed to, uh, to erode uh, ISM uh, and also create these channels and holes through which the Lyman continuum photos may escape. So in this work, the properties inferred from the analysis are interpreted uh, in the context of, of the different uh, proposed modes like these ones uh, in Raman Basson 2020. So I would also like to, to highlight here that uh, the, the broad emission and the complex kinematics uh, start to, to appear in high quality observation uh, uh, in extreme emission line galaxies are, are redshift two-ish or three. 
as I show here in these examples that comes from uh, the, the actual alignment of a uh, survey and from a, a different follow-up uh, of realization analogs conducted with, with MOSFIRE. And, and this is interesting because uh, uh, the lessons learned from the local analogs will help to interpret these uh, and similar studies also accessible with, with uh, JWST. So in, in the same line, uh, uh, a step further, uh, will consist in studying the kinematics using a high resolution spectra with IFUs. And this requires excellent conditions and high signal to noise that not many instruments are, can actually provide. Uh, and this, this example is using GMOS North, where we present a detailed analysis of one of the brightest green peas at lower redshifts, uh, resolving somehow the complex kinematics and establishing a, a methodology. So you can find details on the paper, I will not enter here, uh, uh, but the, the broad emission is basically everywhere, uh, implying that a single Gaussian feeding or a single Gaussian model is insufficient to describe the, the, gas, the gas kinematics. So uh, the best uh, fit model for this, for this particular galaxies implies three components which work well uh, uh, with a high velocity dispersion showing a sort of outflow uh, followed by a highly turbulent uh, component. So you can see here in the velocity dispersion maps. Uh, uh, while the narrower component instead uh, has a velocity somehow compatible with a kind of a distorted radiation uh, rotation pattern uh, and a uniform velocity dispersion, which is compatible with, with the, the, the star formation input at the measure diamond alpha uh, luminosity, which is about uh, 20 kilometers per second or so. So uh, another interesting question that I would like to address in this talk for Greenpeace is that uh, is, is what is the, the nature of, of, of what is the true star formation history of these galaxies? Are they truly young systems or are they uh, 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 galaxies with a, a, a significant underlying star population of, 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 a, of a few giga years old? Uh, like for instance, earlier works have shown for most uh, blue compact bars, for instance, in uh, Reshif zero. So this may have implications for understanding the nature of these galaxies and also for their use uh, as local analogs, of course. So we have addressed this question in earlier works uh, using high uh, signal to noise spectra from the GTC. In that small sample, we found that a relatively old star population should be required to reproduce the spectra. Uh, and, uh, and that this, uh, this underlying component may contribute significantly to the total star mass. So combining optical plus near infrared will, will be crucial in future to address this problem and, and, the, and the, James, the James Webb can actually help on that too. Uh, however, this is, this is a tricky experiment because the, the strong contribution of the nebular continuum in these galaxies should be taken into account. And the nebular continuum in green piece may contribute up to 30% of the total optical continuum flux. Uh, this at some point makes the red part of the spectra flutter, uh, thus uh, mimicking somehow uh, uh, the, uh, an all star population. So it's difficult to disentangle from these two uh, uh, issues, these, these two effects. So this problem has, has been addressed uh, again in a recent paper by, by our postdoc here, Vital Fernandez. And in this work, has, uh, he used uh, the, the FADO spectral synthesis code, which allow us for a better fit of the stellar and nebular emission in a self-consistent way. So our results are in line with the previous ones, uh, highlighting the significant contribution of nebular continuum uh, and the difficulties in core, of current models to determine uh, unambiguously the presence of all star populations. And in the same paper, we also present a new method for chemical abundance analysis, which are in line with the direct method, with the direct method uh, uh, paradigm. So very briefly, we use a Bayesian chemical model that accounts for temperature, density, extinction, plus 11 ionic abundances. And this method also use a, a kind of machine learning techniques to provide the final chemical model, which give us very stable and reliable solutions. So I will not enter in, in many details here, but I invite you to find that in, in, in the paper. 20 minutes. Okay, and finally, I will use my uh, final minute to advertise a great work conducted by, by my student, uh, Mario Gerena, which combines uh, uh, UV, optical, uh, uh, UV and optical data sets to characterize carbon three emitters, a redshift between two and four, 
and study the chemical abundances of these uh, star forming galaxies. So in particular, we, we study uh, stellar and, and, and nebular abundances like those from carbon, oxygen, and iron, which are used to prove uh, relations and also compare with model predictions. So for example, I show here, we find a stronger that the stronger UV uh, uh, emitters have uh, um, carbon to oxygen ratios consistent with uh, very active phases of chemical evolution. With the stronger uh, uh, with the stronger LAEs in the sample having a lower average uh, C over O and, and metallicity, both stellar and gas phase. So more results can be found uh, in, in Mario's uh, poster. And, and the current follow-up studies will help us to prepare future, future uh, similar studies with JWST at this and higher redshift. And in the same line, it is important to highlight the significant role that the Class C survey will have in providing the, the largest high quality data set in the UV for local star forming galaxies, including many extreme emission line galaxies. So this data will be key reference for any comparison to higher redshift galaxies. So I think Matilde Mingozzi will give us details uh, later in, in her talk. So I will leave you uh, here with my, my general conclusions and, and, and I will be happy to, to, to take any questions you may have. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ricardo. No time for questions. You can raise your hand uh, on Zoom or you can write up to other your questions on Slack. Okay, so uh, Alberto, please go ahead. Um, can you, I hope you can hear me. So um, uh, thank you, Ricardo, for the very nice uh, summary of all this interesting work. So I have a question that maybe I missed in the talk, but you say that sometimes it is difficult to disentangle between a contribution of uh, all the stellar population and a highly nebular contributed uh, spectra. So how are you doing at the end to, to disentangle between the two? Yeah, it's very tricky. So first we need to, 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 to consider um, self-consistently the, 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 the contribution of both the, the nebular continuum and the, um, and, and, and the, stellar, the stellar continuum. Um, uh, so using also the, the information from the mission lines. So uh, FADO, this code, what actually does is to, is to, to, to do this. Um, so using the, the, the equivalent width, for instance, of uh, H beta and, and, and producing a, 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 in a self-consistent way, a nebular continuum that best fits uh, the, together with the, with the stellar continuum, the, the spectra of the, of the, of the, of the objects. Uh, but the emission lines are, are of course, uh, let me see if I can move to the, to the slide. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, here. So at the same time, uh, we uh, the, the, the regions populated by, by the, the very prominent emission lines are masked, uh, and therefore, uh, especially in the in the in the in the the blue part of the spectra, is is difficult to 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 fit to reproduce these these features. But the, the net effect of this, this nebular continuum is to flat the red part of the spectra. And therefore, it's, it's, it, 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 there is always uh, uh, an uncertainty here. Uh, uh, and this will require uh, longer wavelengths to, to, to see whether we are in this, in this kind of solution where we don't need a giga year uh, old uh, populations to reproduce this, this part. Or uh, as we, we find here, uh, a significant part uh, of, of the luminosity uh, and, and especially the, the mass fraction is, is taken by, by this uh, SSP. Okay, All right, thank you, Ricardo. So uh, there we have one quick question on the Slack. So Christo Christopher Snap Colas says, Will multi-component fitting of the Lyman alpha line be possible at redshift greater than seven? 
Oh, that's a that's a good a good question. Uh, honestly, I, I I don't know. I'm a bit skeptical about this, uh, especially because of uh, to do this uh, kind of uh, uh, multi-component analysis, we need uh, extremely high signal to noise. Perhaps for the brightest lines, uh, JWST can provide this uh, signal to noise. Uh, we need both uh, very deep observations and uh, and of course uh, 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 high dispersion data, so higher resolution. So will not be easy, but let's see. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thank you, Ricardo. So it's time to move on. So if you have more questions, please write up the uh, uh, write your questions on 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 Slack. So the yeah, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So next, um, next speaker is Kristin McQueen from Ratogas. Please go ahead when you're ready. Uh, Kristen? Okay, can you see my screen and hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so I'd like to speak with you today about the evolutionary pathways of extremely metaphor galaxies or XMP galaxies in the nearby universe. And since this is the beginning of the week, I want to just start with a cartoon picture of the chemical en enrichment of galaxies. And we're going to start by just making a galaxy with a dark matter halo. And in this dark matter halo, we'll accrete some gas. The gas will cool and fragment and form stars. And the more massive of these stars will explode as supernovae depositing energy, momentum, and newly synthesized chemical elements into the ISM of the galaxy. With strong enough star formation, um, the stellar feedback can drive galactic winds and outflows, pushing some of the chemical elements into the um, circumgalactic medium of the galaxy and with enough velocity, pollute the intergalactic medium. Now you can also add um, new gas to the system, diluting any of the abundances in the uh, ISM. And all of this can be dependent upon environment. Um, so there are multiple processes, of course, that um, uh, are at work here, um, but collectively they manifest in the well-known scaling relation, the luminosity and metallicity relation of galaxies. And so what I'm showing here is the gas phase auction abundance of local volume uh, galaxies as a function of their luminosity, which is a tracer of their mass. And galaxies form this um, well-known tight relationship with these two parameters. And we think we understand this relationship where if you, the brighter, more massive galaxies are more um, efficient at forming stars and enriching their ISM. And as you move down this relationship to, to lower mass galaxies, you not only become less efficient at converting your gas into stars, but you're also more apt to lose some of your metals um, from galactic winds in the shallower potential wells. And so this, this relationship at, at redshift of zero is fairly well populated down to about an oxygen abundance of 7.5. But we're interested in looking at extremely metapore galaxies, which we delineate here at an oxygen abundance of 7.35, which is approximately 5% um, solar metallicity. And I'm going to share with you a mix of results of XMP galaxies today. Um, the first one is um, a galaxy called Leo P. And Leo P, um, it comes in at just about, just under 3% solar metallicity. It's very nearby and extremely low mass. Um, we've studied Leo P now for a number of years and from um, a whole bunch of observational constraints, we've been able to do a census of its oxygen uh, atoms. So figuring out how many oxygen atoms were produced by star formation and the distribution of those uh, oxygen atoms in the stars and the, and the ISM. And we've measured a metal retention fraction of the galaxy is 5%. Or in other words, Leo P has lost 95% uh, of its oxygen, um, presumably through stellar feedback processes of pushing these metals out of the galaxy through galactic winds. Uh, and so this agrees with our canonical interpretation of the luminosity and metallicity relation, where as you get down to lower masses, galaxies are more efficient at expelling some of their chemical elements through stellar feedback processes. More recently, we've also found another galaxy named Leoncino. It's just a titch more metal poor than Leo P and it's offset from the luminosity metallicity relation. Now Leoncino is a little bit different than Leo P because it's located in a void environment an under dense environment in the local volume. And there's been some really nice work done by Simon Pistolnik's group on void galaxies. Uh, and some of their work suggests that 
potentially void galaxies undergo slower secular evolution or have less efficient star formation. Um, and so we pulled uh, measurements from the void um, survey on galaxies that have uh, really robust direct method oxygen abundances, which are shown here in cyan. And um, the distribution of points from the, the void galaxies in, in this um, in the luminosity metallicity relation appear to be in agreement with non-void galaxies uh, in the local volume. So it doesn't seem like there's any kind of statistical difference between their evolution. Um, the, the mean in the relationship is offset slightly to lower abundances, but the one sigma dispersion is um, in agreement with what we find in um, your galaxies in non uh, under dense regions. Um, and so um, regardless of which relationship you choose though, Leoncino sits outside of these and is, so is not in agreement with either of these relations, suggesting that it's very low oxygen abundance is not due to environment. Um, it's also interesting though, to look at where um, other X and P galaxies sit in um, the LZR relationship. And so I've pulled a lot of um, results from the literature on X and P galaxies. Uh, and uh, as previously mentioned, there has been a, a large increase in the discovery space of X and C galaxies, which is super exciting. And I'm sure this plot is already out of date. This was published a year ago. Um, but you can see that there is now uh, a lot of points below this 5% solar delineation. And, and all but one of these new discoveries uh, or points is offset from the luminosity metallicity relationship. Um, so I want to point out that some of these, while um, they are new, there are a few galaxies in here that have been known for a few decades, including ones that you all might recognize, ones Wiki 18 and DDO 68. And there's been some really nice work done by Ekt et al. in 2008, looking at the properties of these uh, well-known XMP galaxies, including their H1 gas distributions. And they suggested that um, the galaxies like this that are offset from the LZR relation are all uh, undergoing some sort of gravitational interaction, whether there are uh, two dwarfs merging or whether there is some just gravitational interaction that's disturbing the gaseous disk in these galaxies. It appears that their um, placement in the luminosity metallicity relation is in part driven by this recent uh, gravitational disturbance. And so in this scenario, the gravitational interaction or merger pulls gas from the outer regions of these galaxies uh, into their centers. And the outer regions of their gaseous disk are fairly chemically unenriched. And so it's pulling in maybe not pristine gas, but very low metallicity gas into the centers, diluting their oxygen abundance. And so the galaxies will move down from this relation. But this influx of gas, of course, also triggers star formation. And so a burst of star formation will boost the luminosity in these galaxies. So they not only move down in this plot, but they also move over to the right. And Leoncino seems to fit this description. Um, there is, despite being in a void, there uh, is a putative detection of an H1 bridge connecting it to another galaxy. Uh, and, and Leoncino sits in a very extended H1 uh, gaseous disk the stellar component does. And so this suggests that there is some chemically uh, unenriched gas in the outer regions of Leoncino that has been pulled into the center, um, you know, dilute, potentially diluting its metallicity, but certainly giving it a boost in luminosity from star formation. You can separate out these two effects though by looking at the mass metallicity relationship. And so what I'm showing here are the same points in the local volume legacy uh, survey in black. These are just now oxygen abundance versus the stellar mass of these galaxies. And below the X and P line, I have nearly all of the galaxies shown here, the ones that had either stellar mass measurements reported or ones for which I could calculate stellar masses for. And you can see that this mass metallicity relation, it tightens up considerably, where now you have a number of points that are agreeing um, with an extrapolation of the mass metallicity relation from uh, more massive systems, including Leoncino. And so the offset in the LZR relation appears for these galaxies to be really driven by um, the recent star formation in, and their boost in luminosity, and not quite so much as their uh, dilution of their oxygen abundance. So their oxygen abundance is um, more likely driven by the secular evolution processes that I've already talked about. But there are a number of galaxies that are still significantly offset from the mass metallicity relationship, suggesting uh, that these truly have had their up gas abundances depleted or diluted um, from the infall of gas. 
Um, it's also, though, important to mention that all of the galaxies in the nearby universe that we have looked, we have found older stars. So these are all evolved systems. They are not primitive, sort of premature young galaxies. Uh, and so I think this is an important distinction to remember when we're comparing galaxies in the nearby universe to ones in the early universe, um, that despite having similar ISM uh, abundances, that there is uh, the presence of older stars in these systems. Okay, so in summary, there are three pathways to make an extremely metaphor galaxy at the redshift of zero. The first is through inefficient star formation. The second is through the loss of metals via feedback, and these two go hand in hand. And finally, there's also the possibility of dilution abundances due to the infall or interactions. And again, I stress the infall doesn't have to be from, you know, pristine gas in the IGM. It's more likely the infall of less chemically enriched gas in the outer parts of galaxies. And this best explains outliers in the luminosity and mass metallicity relationships. And while local SMP galaxies are not unevolved systems, they do have ISM and stars with abundances similar to metal poor high redshift galaxies. And so in that regard, um, they could be really good analogs to test ISM and stellar physics. And I'd like to draw your attention to Grace Telford's talk tomorrow, tomorrow morning, um, discussing just that, well, tomorrow morning in um, the United States, um, talking about the properties of an extremely metal poor um, O stars found in nearby galaxies. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kristen. Okay, so time for questions. So you can raise your hand on the Zoom or you can write up to your questions uh, on Slack. Okay, so the other, Emanuele. Hello, sorry. About the explanation about the extremely metal poor with the dilution through in fall interaction. But how could the Leoncino be explained? Because you say it lies in a void, so it cannot have had any fall or any interaction. Right, so, you know, despite being in a void, it's still, um, there are, you know, galaxies and voids don't have to be completely isolated. In fact, the dwarf galaxies that have been found in, dwar in, in voids um, nearly ubiquitously have some sort of nearby dwarf galaxy. There are sort of these loose associations of dwarf galaxies. Um, it's rare to find a dwarf galaxy in a void that is completely without anything in its surroundings. And in Leoncino in particular, there is a, this putative detection of an H1 bridge connecting Leoncino to another galaxy that's uh, nearby on the sky to the system. And so, um, you know, it it, it's, not, it's not an unusual thing to find something else in a void near a dwarf galaxy. Um, but, you know, I don't think that that is the driving factor for Leoncino's low uh, oxygen abundance. I think um, it's, it's probably more likely due to just secular evolution, um, but it's offset from the luminosity metallicity relation um, because of a recent burst of star formation. And so, you know, this this, there's, can, you can have some gas coming into the center and sort of boosting the luminosity, but I think it's, it's auction abundance is primarily driven by secular evolution. Thank you. All right, thank you. So then, Filippo. Uh, yes, hi. Um, uh, what are these galaxy plays with respect to the fundamental metallic relation that takes in, also into account the uh, self emission rate? I, I don't know. That's something that uh, would be interesting to look at, but I don't know where they lie in that. Okay, all right. So any quick questions? If not, it's about time. So, uh, all right, so then let's thank Kristen. Thanks for having me. Okay. So the other next speaker is Yuki Isobe from Tokyo. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. All right, so uh, hi everyone, I'm Yuki Osobe, a PhD student on the University of Tokyo. Today, I'd like to talk about high FFO in extremely metal galaxies. 
Uh, let me explain the background. Chemical abundance of galaxies is a key to understanding the star formation of galaxies. Chemical arrangement of Milky Way is relatively well <coughs> understood through chemical abundances of Milky Way stars. This figure shows the distribution of F over O and F over H of Milky Way stars. As you can see here, Milky Way stars with low of F over H tend to show low F over O. This can be attributed to the dominance of quark collapse supernovae at young ages of Milky Way. Then, as shown in this red arrow, F over O Milky Way stars increase with F over H and thus Milky Way age due to an increase of type 1 supernovae. This monotonic increase in F over O with Milky Way age supports the idea that F over O serves as a cosmic clock. This cosmic clock scenario suggests that young galaxies have low F over ratios, but is that true? Uh, the most direct way to answer this question is to observe young galaxies, but the problem is that young galaxies are expected to be faint intrinsically. So we focus on local young galaxies. Although such young galaxies get rarer to a lower shift, extremely metabolic galaxies, Arrivera species, have been discovered uh, in the local universe in the last decades. And in pages, yeah. Uh, EMPGs are defined to have gas phase average ratios less than 10% of the solar abundance. One of the most famous EMPGs is I2BK18, whose average ratio is 3% of the solar abundance with solar mass of around 10 to 7, 7 solar mass. Such a low metallicity and low solar mass are both suggestive of the early phase of gas formation, so EMPGs are promising candidates of young galaxies. Uh, one of the current problems is that there have been only a few EMPGs reported so far. If stellar mass is less than 10 to 6 solar mass, that is comparable to young galaxies. Uh, so now we should explore such low mass EMPGs. Another problem is that uh, iron emission lines are expected to be very faint. So we need deep spectroscopy to investigate if we have all EMPGs. So yeah, today I, to identify low mass EMPGs, we have launched a new survey entitled Empress. We use super images whose limited magnitude is as deep as 26 magnitude. We also develop a class sphere based on machine learning technique. As shown in this schematic figure, we estimate non-linear boundaries isolating EMPGs from other types of sources in a, a multi-dimensional photometric space. And this figure shows the structure of the class sphere based on the combination of neural network whose input and output parameters of photometry and probabilities, respectively. We train the class sphere with SED models of EMPGs as well as other sources, and then the class sphere returns plausible probabilities of each type of sources. Choosing sources with high probabilities of EMPGs, we obtain 27 faint EMPG candidates from around 40 million sources. Then we conduct deep spectroscopic follow-up observations. So far, we completed the observations for 17 out of the 27 EMPG candidates whose images are here. We use spectrogra spectrographs on large telescopes such as Keck errors. And here, the real spectra, we find that 14 out of the 17 targets show emission lines with high value rates, such as so young ages. So these 14 are promising EMPG candidates. We know that, that the other three are contaminants, one of which are metal rich galaxy, and the other two do not have any emission line. Using the direct temperature method with O3463, we derive all value ratios of the 14 EMPG candidates. This figure shows mass metallicity relations of the candidates and the red and orange circles represent our galaxies with overage less than 10% and more than 10% of the solar abundance, respectively. We find that seven out of the 14 EMPG candidates are truly EMPGs with overage less than 10% of the solar abundance. Among them, we identify J1631, which is a galaxy with the lowest overage ratio ever reported that is only 1.6% of the solar abundance. We also find that all the seven EMPGs have stellar masses less than 10 to the six solar mass. So our survey APRES successfully identified seven EMPGs with stellar masses less than 10 to the six solar mass. 
Here we report another main result about F over O over VGs. We derive F over O from the F3, 46, 58 lines. This figure shows F over O over VGs as a function of O over H. Please look at the most metaphor galaxies of J6031 and J0811. Although they have O H over around 2% of the solar abundance, they have high F over O ratios comparable to the solar abundance. This result seems opposite to the expectation from the cosmic clock scenario. So we investigate the origin of the high F over O of the two MPGs. One may remind dust depletion because the decreasing trend of F over O with O by H can be explained by selective depletion of iron on the dust grains. However, the dust depletion scenario requires the assumption that these images originally have high the Hugo ratios, while the Hugo O of intergalactic medium is lower than those of the EMPGs, which implies that the EMPGs do not originally have such high Hugo ratios. Thus, the dust depletion is not likely to be the origin of the high Hugo O. One may also think that episodic star formation can explain the high Hugo O. This schematic figure explains the scenario. Where metal gas accretes onto the metal rich galaxy, over which would decrease while F over would keep the original value. Such a galaxy would also have high N over ratio enriched by AGB stars. This green line represents the evolution track of F over O and N over O of episodic star formation. It starts at the top right here and goes down to the bottom left until the age of 100 mega year as quark supernovae become more dominant, then go back to the top right direction with an increase of type 1 supernovae and AGV stars. However, an important fact is that, as you can see here, the two EMPGs with higher herbal have low N over ratios, and this evolution track does not reproduce high herbal and low N over ratios simultaneously. Thus, Episodic star formation is not likely to explain the higher of all the two MPGs. Then, what is the origin of the higher of all? The equivalent width of the MPGs can be a key to answering this question. This figure shows the F of all as a function of equivalent width of H beta that can serve as a proxy of galaxy age. We find that two MPGs with higher of all show high equivalent width, which suggests that the presence of iron suppliers at the early phase of star formation. We also confirmed that a model uh, calculating ejecta of only type 1 supernovae and normal quark collapse supernovae cannot reproduce the high F of all the two MPGs. But what about other supernovae? Yeah, actually, metaphor environment allows the existence of exotic quark collapse supernovae such as hypernovae, whose projectile stars are as massive as 30 to 100 solar mass. Such a massive star will explode in seven mega year. This schematic figure illustrates the structures around the star cores. Compared with normal colocal supernovae, hypernovae have large nickel 56 cores represented by this blue region due to their large explosion energies. Nickel 56 decays into iron 56, so uh, hypernovae can produce high global gas. We can also assume the presence of fair intermediate supernovae in the metaphor environment. Their progenitor stars are as massive as 200 to 300 solar mass that will explode in three mega year. PI sand do not leave any remnant like black holes, so they can eject a large amount of nickel 56. So hypernovae and PISN can produce higher herbal gas in young axes. In the next slide, we investigate this more quantitatively. Summing up ejecta of hypernovae or PSN as well as no, normal coca supernovae, we construct a few of our evolution models. We show the models in this figure, like here. And the purple and yellow curves represent a few of our evolution models of hypernovae and PISN, respectively. As you can see, these models can reproduce high equilibrium at young ages, so we conclude that hypernovae or PISN can be responsible for the high equilibrium of the two MPGs. This result implies that very young galaxies would also have high equilibrium ratios, which means that there are two eras where galaxies would have high equilibrium ratios, one of which is a very young age, and the other is the old age. So, if we overall may not serve as a cosmic clock for young galaxies. A minute. Thank you. Yeah, uh, here's a summary. 
Uh, so thank you for listening and please feel free to ask any question. Okay, all right. Thank you, Yuki. All time for questions. So maybe people are still working on writing up the, uh, the questions on the Slack, maybe. Yeah, we have sufficient time for questions, especially young people are encouraged to ask questions. Oh, yeah. Holly Cuts. Okay, I got the uh, the question from Holly Cuts. So he says, very nice talk. Do you have any constraints on what fraction of supernova in the galaxy will be parents TV to supernovae and hypernova versus normal quark collapse? Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, we assume that uh, in the PIS, model, we assume 100% uh, of PISN at uh, the first projector stars are uh, larger than 140 to 300 solar mass. And uh, below 100 solar mass, we assume the uh, all the stars uh, as a quarkula supernovae. Uh, while uh, in the hypernovae model, Hypernova model, we assume uh, the 20% of the uh, stars with 100 uh, stars around 30 to 100 solar mass uh, will explode as hypernovae, while other 80% of the stars explode as quark-lab supernovae, normal quark-lab supernovae. So uh, if we assume more uh, hypernovae than the, this model, we raise up to the uh, higher FMO direction. Okay, All right, thank you. So, and I have the, uh, we have many questions now. So, Daniel Chalet uh, asks, uh, says that, nice talk. Uh, how could you distinguish hypernova and the pair instability supernova? Is there any sign of, a uh, sign of the odd even signature in elemental ratios expected from pair instability supernova? Yeah, thank you for your question. And this is a very uh, good point. And uh, we are now uh, discussing the uh, signature to distinguish hypernovae and PISN from the other types of uh, other uh, elements. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, uh, we are now constructing the models and then uh, keep, uh, investigate such kind of uh, signature. Okay, thank you. And the last question from Peter Sentina. Great talk. I'm curious if you have thoughts about why we don't see evidence for similar enrichment patterns and highly in enhanced FE overall in reservoir star populations in the local group that could have been enriched by similar supernovae. Hmm, yeah, thank you for the, the question. And that is also a very good question. And actually, uh, we find uh, such kind of very high FUO ratios in totally uh, middle of our galaxies are with 2% of the solar abundance. So uh, <clears throat> maybe we find a more uh, galaxies with high FUO ratios uh, in this extremely low metallicity end. Yeah, that would be very nice. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. So it's time to yeah stop here. So uh, if you have more questions, please write up your questions on 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 Slack. All right. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you. So, yeah, it's time to move to the other lightning talks.
Okay, so please share the screen of the slides. Okay, thank you very much. So the other, so Nimisha, uh, you know, just emailed me and she, uh, uh, you know, she wants to cancel her talk. So uh, let's start from Ryan. Uh, Ryan Rickard, Fault. Are you ready? Yes. So, yeah, great. Please go ahead. <laughs> All right, so one Zwicky 18 is a puzzling galaxy due in part to exceptionally low metallicity, as well as the presence and debated origin of helium-2-4686 emission. We observed one Zwicky 18 using the Keck Cosmic Web Imager, and these integral field spectroscopy data revealed the presence of two previously unseen regions of helium-2 emission, also known as helium-3 regions, northwest and southeast of the main helium-3 region in the galaxy's central body investigated in previous studies. The helium-2 emission is of uncertain origin and with enhanced intensities compared to H beta, up to um, about 10%, and lies along an axis collinear with the position of Wanzuki 18's ultra-luminous X-ray source. We explored if Wanzuki 18's ULX could be produced um, by the ULX, however, we um, find no evidence of shocks, so it, the X-ray would have to be beamed. Oh, sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, we recently performed some Voronoi binning and found even more helium-2 emission, which extends out to about one kiloparsec, as well as um, oxygen-3-4363, and we used um, the overall line measurement to create a metallicity map of ones with the 18 and we find no evidence for a metallicity gradient. However, we do see um, variation between the central star forming region of Wandsworth 18 and the extended gas regions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. So let's move on. Next is the other Alejandro. Hi, can you can you hear me? Uh, yes, but the other, can you speak loudly? Maybe you can hear me better now? Well, hopefully it works. Is it reasonable now? Uh, yeah, I think it's better. <laughs> okay, uh, so let's go. Um, hi, thank you for having me. I am Alejandro Lumbreras Calle and I'm a postdoc at the CEFCA Institute in Teruel. And I am here to present to you uh, a new sample of uh, extreme oxygen three emitters at low redshift using the J plus survey. Uh, there's a thing missing here in the in the center of the slide, which is the main uh, result from this uh, poster. Uh, so we find 466 new uh, extremely em extreme emitters at low redshift, with uh, equivalent with enough GN3 above 300 Armstrongs. So out of this sample, 410 were previously unknown. Uh, so we did this using the J plus survey, which uh, you can see uh, an example of one of these galaxies in the top right. Uh, it's a multiband survey, which has observed 2000 square degrees of the sky. So uh, we use a medium band filter uh, to select specifically uh, the emission in oxygen three. So this way we are 20 to 50 times more efficient that broadband surveys have been finding extreme emitters like the blueberries or the green peas. And we also find objects with low oxygen 3 to H alpha, which uh, previous surveys were biased against. And well, if you want to know more, which I hope you will, uh, you can go check out the poster or the, the talk, the, the recorded talk. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Alejandro. Uh, next is Siaza Catherine Weatherspoon. Hello, everyone. My name is Catherine Witherspoon, and I am a graduate student working with Eric Wilcox at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, today in my poster, I will be discussing my work on AGN and low mass galaxies in the SDSS Manga survey. Uh, as an example, I show here the resolved VPT diagram of one of the AGN in my sample. Uh, I will be comparing the nearby environments of galaxies with and without AGN, and then I will split my samples of AGN and non-AGN into star forming and quiescent subsamples in order to compare the environments of these subsamples of the AGN and non-AGN. Uh, interestingly, we find that quenched AGN are more likely to be isolated or in low mass groups, and actually 15% of uh, the AGN are 
quenched and isolated. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop by my poster. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So next is Dennis, please. Hello, my name is Dennis Leahy, University of Calgary. Uh, I've recently obtained new uh, FUV and NUV photometry of M31 with the UVIN instrument on AstroSat between 140 and 280 nanometers. So I've combined that with uh, existing SS, uh, SDSS photometry and optical uh, Spitzer photometry and in infrared and Herschel photometry in far infrared to obtain the spectral energy distribution of the central bulge of M31 and uh, model that using a couple approaches. One is the Sigale Galaxy uh, SED modeling code. Uh, and here at the top is shown the uh, best fit model to all of our data. Uh, and we obtain a number of parameters. One disadvantage of this is it doesn't allow metallicity of different populations. So we took a different approach, created our own code to model different metallicity populations. But to combining those two, we find uh, the summary, which is given uh, down at the bottom. I think it's off the page of the slide. Uh, I'll, that's all. Thank you. So the next is. Christopher Snap Colas. Hi, I am uh, Christopher Snap Colas, and I'm working with uh, Brian Siena at the University of California, Riverside. I'm uh, presenting here on the Lyman Alpha escape properties of dwarf galaxies at cosmic high noon. We made uh, observations using the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea. Uh, we made these observations using the LRIS and MOSFIRE arms of Keck to observe the REST UV and REST optical spectra, respectively. Um, and we show here some of the properties and measurements of this sample. In the top left, we show the distributions of our sample from just the LRIS observations and those using LRIS and MOSFIRE in bins of absolute UV magnitude. In the top right, we show the redshift distributions of our sample, as well as the sky transmission spectrum. In the bottom left, we show the Lyman alpha equivalent width as a function of absolute UV magnitude. And in the bottom right, we show the Lyman alpha escape fraction as a function of absolute UV magnitude. Uh, we observe some tentative trends in uh, both of these quantities with absolute UV magnitude. If you'd uh, like to learn more about this, please come see my poster. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So I think this is the end of the uh, the lightning talk. So uh, then you know we are now the uh, the moving to the the break and the uh, interaction posters. Okay, up to the uh, two thirty. So now we are pre we are preparing the uh, the breakout rooms for speakers this session and poster record is talk folks. So uh, yeah, you know, maybe now I think you can choose the, uh, oh yeah, breakout room is there. So you can choose the other, the other, the, your favorite breakout room, okay. And uh, the other speakers and also the poster folks, please move to the other, your breakout room and uh, wait for somebody coming, okay. And then, you know, it's totally up to you. So yeah, whatever, taking a break or you know, chatting with the other somebody you want to talk. Okay, yeah. So yeah, let's start for the other uh, break and the interaction.
sorry. Uh, is there anybody uh, know how to move to the breakout room? Uh, hi, Ricardo. So uh, I think you can just uh, hover your cursor over to the room yeah. that you want to join. And then there should be a, like over the number, there should be a join button. You can just click it. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, no problem. So for those of you presenting in the next session, um, maybe we can run through and just test that the screen sharing and everything is working as expected. Um, and I guess I could just go down the list or we'll just see who's around because uh, I know it's technically the break. Uh, Peter, are you online? Hey, yep, just got back. Cool. So I'm testing my screen share, right?
One second. Okay. Yep, looks good. Cool. Thanks. All right, Sabrina. Yes, I'm here. And it's is it Steerwald, your last name? Uh, yes, if appropriately said. <laughs> um, but well, how would you prefer it say, said? I just say Steerwald. Steerwald. <laughs> you pronounced okay. it like better German. Uh, How does that look? Good. Can you hear me okay also? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, Sophia. Hello. Hi, and it's, it's flurry? Yes. Okay. All right, can you see that all right? Yes. All right, Alberto. Yes, I'm here. Um, you, and now you should be able to see the slides. Yes, and it's Saldana, Saldana Lopez. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. And the last one is Rohan. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm here. Um, cool. Let's share. Yeah, yep. is that visible? Mm -hmm. Am I audible? All the magical Zoom words? <laughs> Seems to be the case. Yeah, and my name is Rohan Naidu. Yes. Not many syllables to uh, play with, thankfully. <laughs> All right, so I think that's everyone. So thanks for, for testing it out. Uh, everyone has a 15 minute slot and we're going to try to do the thing like with the last few talks where, you know, if you can aim to finish around 11 minutes, that way we have enough time for questions afterwards. Um, that would be great. And of course, after this session, there's going to be the same thing that's happening now with breakout rooms where you can presumably go into your breakout room and have conversations with people. And we'll also be handling, um, you know, for all the questions that we can't get to on Slack, uh, you're encouraged to just answer them, you know, type them out afterwards as well. And right. by the way, Michael, uh, so you can see this uh, countdown clock, right? Do you yes. want me to keep running it or you want to keep the time keeping work by yourself? Uh, this timer is very helpful. So if you can keep doing it, that would be great. Okay, cool. And uh, another thing is like for the speakers, when you're sharing the screen, can you still see this clock? Okay, that, that's cool. Cause like it, it has a, it should have a rain, have an alarm and uh, but it turns out that only I can hear it. So, so please keep an eye on it. So I, yeah, I t when I tested it, it can ring an alarm at a, like eight minutes, 10 minutes, but it seems like nobody can hear it. So just please keep an eye on by yourselves. Yeah. So yeah, that's it for me. Um, hello, Michael. Michael Massena. Hi. Yes. Uh -huh. ah, great, great, great. I think it's, yeah, thank you for the other work, you know, serving as the other uh, chair in the next session. Yeah, yeah we, did the, we did the testing. Everyone seems to be oh, able done. to share the screen and everything. So I think we're ready to go. Okay.
<laughs> so quick. Okay, good, good job. Okay, great. Yeah.
Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in two minutes. Um, Ichi, so are you ready to close the other breakout room, rooms? Yes, do you want me to close it now? There's a 60 second countdown. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm doing it now. Okay, it is 2.30 everyone. We're gonna continue on the session from, uh, from earlier on local dwarf galaxies. And the first speaker is Peter Senchina from Carnegie. Please go ahead, Peter. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, super excited to talk with you all about uh, some more local uh, dwarf galaxies, as, as Michael mentioned, these star forming systems. And I wanna focus in particular on results from a paper that we just submitted um, and uh, excited to talk about uh, specifically focusing on this, this nebular carbon-4 emission. Um, and, you know, so first to take a step back, you know, a simple picture of what we're going to be able to do with James Webb um, you know, in characterizing the first galaxies is that we want to be able to take this nebular emission, this hot star continuum that we observe, uh, and here illustrated by this nice spectrum from a paper by Danielle Berg uh, back in 2018 at, at lower redshift, um, and be able to take that, that constraint on this nebular emission, this gas emission, and this, this, this hot star continuum, compare this to stellar population synthesis models, and actually extract constraints thereby on physical properties that we care about, like stellar mass, metallicity, the age, the star formation history. And you can see here in this, in, in this uh, uh, plot, the model comparison is this, this red spectrum that's overlaid. But uh, the, you know, the, the key problem here is that this middle part has a lot hidden in it. And these stellar population synthesis models have a lot of uncertainties that we haven't fully grappled with yet. You know, just to highlight a few of these here very briefly, uh, these uh, massive stars drive very strong stellar winds uh, driven by uh, ra radiation absorption onto to metal lines that are very difficult to model. Uh, these massive stars also likely undergo binary mass transfer, which can dramatically affect their evolution, both stripping and also rejuvenating these stars and producing even hotter, more luminous systems. And it can also produce, uh, these massive stars might be affected by fast rotation and in, in the most extreme case, even chemically homogeneous evolution. Um, driven by that rotation. And, you know, at the end of the day, our inferences are only as good as, as these stellar models. Uh, and, you know, as, as nicely illustrated here, a line that I'm quite uh, a, uh, a fan of, this helium-2 line you can see uh, is not reproduced by the stellar model at all. Um, and, you know, as a case study, this nebular carbon-4 emission that we're finding at high redshift is a perfect illustration of, of the difficulties that some of these uncertainties introduce. So this carbon-4 resonant doublet, 1548, 1551, it's canonically a signature of AGN activity. But surprisingly, we're finding in a significant number of these pathfinder spectra of star-forming galaxies at redshift-6 at extraordinarily prominent equivalent widths of like 20 to 40 angstroms. And this sort of strength is only barely reproduced by stellar models at very low metallicities with large uncertainty. 
And the, uh, part of the source of that uncertainty is that we've never actually been able to study massive stars like those that the models are telling us are required to power this intense nebular carbon for. Um, and that's the, the issue there is that in the local group, these models are anchored by resolved stellar populations, but the local group only gets us down so low in metallicity, only about 20% solar in the, the SMC. And so our models for these massive stars are actually empirically uncalibrated at the metallicities that the models are telling us are required to power the strong nebular emission. But fortunately, uh, in recent years, uh, the co uh, cosmic origin spectrograph on board HST or HST-COS has actually shown us that a significant population of local, slightly further field dwarf galaxies do power this nebular carbon core. Um, and in fact, we find that if you go to low metallicity in the gas phase oxygen and to young ages of high equivalent with H beta on the plot here on the x-axis, uh, we actually find that this nebular carbon four is nearly ubiquitous. So we're finding it in almost every system that we look at uh, in these very young, very low metallicity systems. And suggests these systems are actually very good lab laboratories to study the stars responsible um, and to get at uh, those, those massive stars directly. But actually getting at the, the stellar features in those systems requires very deep UV spectroscopy uh, because those stellar features at low metallicity are still quite faint even in these local systems. Um, and so here in this, this paper focuses on uh, some new ultra deep uh, HST uh, G160M spectroscopy that we took over uh, cycles 26 and 27 um, that uh, devoted about five to 10 orbits per object to really nail down the signal to noise in the continuum and get at these massive stars. You can see some of the properties of these galaxies here. Uh, the 12 plus LIGO H span a decent range, uh, all in the metal pore regime. Um, and you know, these H beta equivalent widths suggest ages of, of about two to 10 mega years, depending on your star formation history. And the key question we want to be able to answer with these spectra are what are the properties and especially what are the metallicities of these massive stars that are powering carbon four? And again, all of, all of these systems are, are selected uh, to power nebular carbon four by, by construction. Um, and so the, here are some uh, uh, snapshots of these spectra that we, we obtained. And you can see here that I'm highlighting in blue this nebular emission in carbon four that they were selected on. Um, and also, and in, in you can see immediately in uh, purple here, this P Cygni absorption from uh, carbon four in the massive star atmospheres. So extending to thousands of kilometers per second, you're seeing winds blowing off of these massive stars directly already just in the carbon four profile, just highlighting the power of these spectra. Um, but first I want to focus on that nebular emission in blue. And uh, I'm ordered these systems here by their equivalent width and the carbon four nebular line from the weakest on the top left to the strongest on the bottom right. And intriguingly, if you compare the profile of this carbon-4 uh, emission at this, this high resolution and signal-to-noise to the other nebular lines like oxygen-3 here in green, you can see that um, this profile of the nebular carbon-4 emission at this high signal-to-noise is not perfectly Gaussian and actually deviates pretty strongly from oxygen-3 in this interesting way where the weakest emitters show this red-shifted absorption, uh, sorry, red-shifted emission and blue-shifted absorption, and the strongest emitters uh, get up to you know, purely emission profiles that are broadened and even double peaked in some of the most extreme cases. And this appears to actually follow a Lyman alpha-like sequence from absorbed and redshifted to double peaked. And su this suggests that this uh, resonant scattering is actually impacting this nebular carbon-4 that we're seeing, at least locally. And this has been suggested before by Danielle uh, and uh, uh, debated to some degree in, in a paper by Gray et al. in 2019. And we suggest that you know, this, this seems like pretty strong evidence that this resonance scattering actually is happening. And we suggest that the easiest way to actually get um, the high, high enough column densities to you know, produce this locally is that what we're seeing is that there are these circumgalactic clouds of carbon-4 that sometimes intervene along our line of sight and absorb out some of this, uh, or scatter out rather, some of this uh, carbon-4 that's coming from these H2 regions. And you know, this is crucial to consider in our photoionization modeling but it's uh, exciting to note that potentially this is much less significant at redshift greater than six because we know that this carbon four um, absorption fraction actually decreases at these high redshifts. This might excel also help explain some of the differences we find with the high redshift systems in this carbon four uh, distribution. But you know, our primary goal here was to get at these, uh, these photospheric absorption lines of iron that are formed directly in the stellar continuum. And that was our goal in nailing down this continuum. And you can see that when we, uh, in, these, in these spectra, a lot of these wiggles actually to not turn out to be uh, very well aligned with known uh, wavelengths of iron uh, four and iron five absorption. And we can fit these with stellar population synthesis models um, 
and uh, you know, in, and these lines are significantly less impacted by the uncertainties uh, like those in winds um, that impact these these models. Uh, and so we can when we fit these with continuum in a continuum normalized space using Charlot and Bruce Wall, stellar probably those synthesis models, um, and incorporating nebular continuum and uh, uh, doing a uh, uh, nested sampling routine in order to extract constraints on parameters of interest, we can actually fit these directly to, to get out leverage on the stellar iron, uh, uh, stellar iron abundance. And when we do that and compare those stellar iron abundances here on the y-axis to the gas phase oxygen abundances on the x, uh, we find that these stellar iron abundances seem to be offset systematically low relative to what would be expected in green here from a one-to-one -one relationship where these uh, the iron and oxygen are at solar abundance uh, and uh, you know, with varying assumptions about the, the gas phase depletion here in, in different shades. Uh, and so it seems that these systems are more iron poor than we would expect. And as nicely outlined earlier uh, in talks earlier today, um, this uh, is kind of naturally expected from this picture in which oxygen is primarily produced by core class supernovae, uh, whereas iron is produced on longer time scale by type 1a supernovae. Um, and you, in, the, in that scenario, you would expect to find this, this depletion um, or this rather enhancement in oxygen to iron. We've already seen this in Redshift 2. But we've, we've seen kind of mixed results in the local universe from the gas phase iron, uh, which is subject to a different set of systematic uncertainties than uh, the sort of analysis that we've done here. And uh, you know, here there are, there are some uncertainties like this absolute gas phase oxygen abundance, but it suggests that what we're seeing in these local systems is evidence for uh, statistically significant enhancement in oxygen to iron, uh, independent of, of the some exact assumptions about the gas phase. Uh, metallicity scale, and it suggests these targets, you know, we can't say whether they're truly younger, but they seem to be more chemically analogous uh, to young high-Z star forming systems and then to the bulk of local systems, local galaxies. Um, and, you know, excitingly, we also have these direct constraints on stellar features in addition to these photospheric absorption lines, like this wind line of carbon-4 and of helium-2. And so this is giving us direct insight into uh, massive stars at low metallicity and their features. Uh, and we, we want to ask whether our population synthesis models can actually match these. And interestingly, what we find is that the carbon-4 is actually systematically underpredicted by model fits to the photospheric lines. So when you fit the photospheric lines, we get this green fit, which is uh, you know, significantly weaker in the carbon-4 wind profile than observed. And what we find is that actually matching it requires much higher metallicity, uh, and this, this might reflect deficiencies in the treatment of these massive star atmospheres, uh, or potentially in uh, the you know, populations of these most luminous stars that drive these dense winds um, at these very low metallicities. But it could also potentially be alleviated by uh, uh, adopting a variation in the carbon to iron abundance in these models. So an enhancement of carbon relative to iron could also boost the strength of this, this carbon uh, wind line uh, and potentially explain some of these deficiencies. But right now we don't have those uh, integrated population synthesis models with varied abundances in order to test this. Um, you know, and this, this is reflected also by some other recent work, uh, another paper I put out last year, or earlier this year rather, and also a paper by Ida Wofford um, this year as well, both illustrate that when we fit these um, well-resolved high signal noise uh, wind profiles in local galaxies, they're actually quite difficult to reconcile um, with other observations, uh, the nebular lines, uh, in these in these very well studied systems, and so you know it's exciting that potentially if, with James Webb we'd be able to detect some of these uh, wind profiles and get out constraints on the stellar metallicity. But right now the population synthesis models are such that these uh, constraints need to be taken with um, uh, you know with interpreted with some caution, uh, as you can get out metallicities that are quite different um, from other tracers in these in these local systems. And you know, and I'll you know I'll briefly uh, you know propose that I think this this you know there's this bright outlook in using these um, uh, these observations to both uh, understand the drivers of nebular carbon four, paint this picture necessary in order to to interpret carbon four emitters at high redshift, and also uh, in in actually directly using these observations along with the resolved star uh, observations to directly constrain metal poor massive stars uh, in the in the local universe in this this sort of integrated and resolved um, synthesis uh, uh, going forward with, with programs like Classy, Ulysses, um, and, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the increasing amount of ultraviolet stuff that we're gathering in, in HST's uh, uh, final years. And yeah, so to summarize, I think this nebular carbon-4, very exciting, uh, potentially a very um, good tracer for, for young assembling systems at low metallicity at high redshift. Um, and locally, it looks like it is actually associated directly with very metal poor, uh, below 10% massive stars, suggests these systems are significantly enhanced in oxygen. Uh, and um, this tension between photospheric wind features, again, I think gives us some exciting leverage on massive star physics in a relatively, un or in a, you know, adhered for unexplored metallicity regime. Uh, thanks for listening. Great. Thank you, Peter. Uh, do we have questions either in person or on Slack? Um, I guess I have a quick question. I'm I'm still trying to reconcile your results with um, the results that we saw previously from um, Isobe et al. And I'm I mean yeah, anything you could say would be interesting, but also. I'm curious if part of the difference is due to the fact that we're talking gas phase versus stellar iron abundances. Do you think that plays some role? Yeah, so it could. So one is, you know, it's an assumption we make here is that, um, and I think I think it's a reasonably safe assumption, but that the the abundances of the H two region gas uh, that these stars are ionizing are, are matched to the to the massive stars themselves. And I think that that's that seems to be a, a good assumption based on, you know, uh, situations like very local universe situations where we can study, you know, directly these, uh, the massive star abundances and compare them to the, the H2 region abundances in these, in these resolved systems, that seems to hold true. Um, but I think, you know, that's, that's something that must be analyzed. And of course, in that comparison, uh, you know, the, that, that gas phase abundance scale comes into play um, in, in uh, determining the actual, the direct, the, you know, the exact scaling or the exact uh, oxygen and iron that we get out. Uh, and it's interesting, there are, there, you know, there are systematic uncertainties in both of these, they're different. Uh, you know, in, the, in the gas phase, we have, we have issues with depletion, iron is strongly depleted onto dust, and also with ionization corrections and that we're only observing you know, this uh, one or two ionization stages. Um, and uh, there is some hope though that, that these can be uh, brought into agreement. So Danielle also had a paper this last year looking at iron in one of these systems, J104457 in the gas phase. And uh, you see they, they basically have repeated this sort of analysis, but directly with, with oxygen to iron in, in gas phase alone and found uh, uh, metallicities or the yeah, oxygen to iron that's actually pretty uh, in good agreement with the metallicity that, or the, the measurements that we're getting out from this stellar gas phase comparison. So it might be also that we're just looking at different systems and that if we had looked at more than these six, you know, we would have found a, a broader range. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly something uh, interesting in, in uh, comparing this. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I think we can move on to our next speaker. There's a question on Slack that maybe you can answer there. Uh, Peter. Sounds good, thanks. So, yeah, thanks again. Uh, so our next speaker is Sabrina Stewalt from Occidental College. And so these two speakers have been up very early giving the presentation. So I'm very appreciative uh, <laughs> for them to, to be willing to do this. And also of course our participants who are up at all times today. So yes, please Sabrina, go ahead. All right, hopefully you can see that. So hi, I'm Sabrina Steerwalt. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and thank you to the organizers for all of your efforts. I come from Occidental College, which is a small liberal arts college, meaning we don't have any graduate students. In, uh, with, we have a very diverse student population and we're nestled in the heart of Los Angeles. And so today I wanna to talk to you about star clusters in merging dwarf galaxies. So a key prediction of the lambda cold dark matter paradigm is that emerging, when we see the merging together of smaller structures to form larger ones, that should happen all the way down. So even at low galaxy masses, we should see these mergers. Uh, we also know that mergers are an important mode of galaxy evolution. Mergers result in increased star bursts, higher AGN fractions, diluted metals, bluer colors. But this picture that we have in our minds of how mergers progress at low redshift is actually based on what we know about massive galaxies. Uh, and we know very little about how this merger uh, scenario translates down to lower galaxy masses. 
<clears throat> in particular, uh, dwarf galaxies have shallower gravitational potential wells. So there are a lot of reasons why we should suspect that massive galaxy mergers and all that we know about them doesn't just translate down to lower galaxy masses. Uh, so for example, we might have more interactions, but fewer mergers at lower galaxy mass. Uh, supernova feedback might be more important. The role of AGN might be less important. Uh, we might see different dynamical time scales due to these lower masses, more of what I call dynamical processing because dwarfs don't have these stabilizing features like bars or arms, so everything gets stirred up. And we don't know if the end products are still red quenched systems. So we need to know more about dwarf dwarf mergers as a population. Well, this is, oh, so some examples of likely dwarf dwarf interactions exist. Uh, here I'm just showing a few favorites uh, that have been studied in detail in the local universe, but we don't know how representative these examples actually are. So this is where Tiny Titans comes in. We're conducting a systematic study of interacting dwarf galaxies. So by systematic, I mean, we've combed the Sloan Digital Sky Survey for low redshift pairs. Uh, we put a maximum projected pair separation and velocity separation. And very importantly, we require that our interacting pairs be more than one and a half megaparsecs from a massive neighbor. So this is key because uh, we all know that massive galaxies can really mess up a, uh, the life of a dwarf. And so we really wanna get at what is the physics that's happening because these dwarfs are interacting and eliminate as much of the larger scale environmental effects as we can. So our complete sample allows us to make statistical claims about dwarf dwarf mergers as a population. So we've started to piece together what star formation looks like in these merging dwarfs. And as I mentioned already, we know that massive galaxy mergers inspire powerful starbursts and we expect their end products to be red quiescent systems, but is the same true for dwarfs? Well, with tiny titans, we've seen that you do get a star formation rate enhancement uh, by being in a pair. So a dwarf living out its life in an interacting pair is going to have more star formation by a factor of something like two than a, a the same dwarf uh, matched in redshift and stellar mass uh, that's not in a pair. And we also see this out to pretty far pair separations, which means that we suspect these starbursts can be triggered early on and throughout the merger. So it's an, uh, more of an ongoing process than in massive systems. We also see evidence that this enhancement, so here I'm showing enhancement versus stellar mass of the galaxy involved, we see evidence that this enhancement is even more important in low mass mergers than it is in more massive ones. Despite all this extra star formation though, we don't see any evidence that the gas supplies get cut off. Um, in fact, through our work with a comparison sample of interacting dwarfs that are near massive hosts, we see that it's only when you put a massive a, a dwarf interaction near a massive galaxy, so within 200 kiloparsecs, that you see any depletion of the gas supply. And this was uh, confusing at first because our dynamic, uh, dynamical modeling of some of the very closest Tiny Titans pairs shows that dwarf dwarf interactions are very good at throwing out the gas. But what appears to be happening, uh, this is work led by Sarah Pearson, that the gas gets thrown out, but then it parks itself in these large reservoirs and can continue to feed this star formation in these interactions. We also see that star formation is much more widely distributed throughout the merger rather than more centrally concentrated like we tend to see in more massive galaxy mergers. Uh, and this we've seen with some work that my colleague George Pravon is doing with Muse. And so here are some of these, his beautiful uh, Muse imaging of one of our very late stage mergers. But let's zoom in a little bit on some of these star clusters. So uh, we have a Hubble program that I wanna show some of the results from that gets the question, can these galaxy-galaxy interactions change a dwarf's cluster mass function? So our, in order to find isolated dwarf pairs, we have to move a little bit further out than the past talks that we've been looking at. So we're not talking about individual stars, we're talking about clusters as something that on the size of 10 to the four uh, solar masses. So this program was inspired by this plot here, which shows that uh, it's galaxy star formation rate on the x-axis and uh, magnitude of the largest star cluster in that galaxy 
galaxy on the y-axis. And so most of the galaxies follow this uh, relationship that you might expect. You have a bigger galaxy, you have more stuff, you can form a bigger cluster. But you can see I've highlighted three points here, which are dwarf galaxies with suspicious uh, either asymmetric H1 distributions or uh, stellar streams. They look like they might have had some merger history. And so we see these dwarf galaxies that have unusually large star clusters. Uh, that don't fit the cluster mass function that we predict. Uh, and they have no business having them because they're, they're small galaxies. They shouldn't have such large star clusters. So our Hubble program is trying to answer the question of whether merger history is, to, uh, is responsible. Uh, so here is one of our uh, pairs that I'm just going to focus on because I don't have too much time. Uh, but this is one of our pairs. So you can see we have three bands. Um, we did some uh, standard cluster uh, uh, cluster detection techniques and then uh, SCD modeling uh, to get the ages and the masses and the cluster mass functions of these clusters. So you can see these two galaxies have these really beautiful uh, star forming knots um, uh, highlighted by the H alpha and green. So zooming in on this smaller galaxy, so this is the secondary pair member, lower mass uh, pair member, we see that in this top plot is showing you the cluster ages. So the lighter dots are younger clusters, and we see they like to clump on the outsides, and they tend to face the other galaxy, which suggests that potentially they were inspired by this interaction. Uh, we see the most massive clusters, though, are more evenly distributed. Those are the diamonds shown here um, on, the, on the bottom plot. And here's our more massive, our primary galaxy pair member. And we see uh, in this galaxy, there is some suggestion that younger clusters sort of clump towards the edges where they might uh, face the other galaxy. But in this more massive pair member, we see more of a distribution, a more of an even distribution in both age and mass throughout the galaxy. So going back to the plot that inspired this program, I put these two galaxies on here and we can see that they do, uh, these galaxies that we know are involved in an interaction, they do tend to pop up above this relationship. And I mentioned we have a larger sample. Uh, so if I put the rest of our sample on here too, we see that some interacting dwarfs do host these unusually large superstar clusters. They sit above this relation. So if you're interested in learning more and happen to be going to the AAS, uh, most of this work has been uh, led by an undergraduate uh, and she'll, Tareem High, and she'll be giving a poster showing our the full comparison of the cluster mass functions at AAS, um, as well as a comparison to non-interacting dwarfs. So, so the next stage of this question is, uh, do non-interacting dwarfs also pop up above this relation? So in summary, uh, this is the team of undergraduates that I work with, and this is just one question that we're trying to answer with Tiny Titans. Uh, we're trying to answer a range of questions um, that uh, about how the physics of dwarf dwarf mergers broadly impact galaxy evolution. Uh, so I will end there, and I will mention uh, I have it's very early in the morning, as has been mentioned here, and I cannot join the breakout group uh, because I have to take my kids to school and then teach a few classes, but I will be on Slack and I'm very interested to talk to anyone who's interested in Dwarf Galaxy Merger fun. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sabrina. We have time for questions. Uh, Angela. We, we don't hear you, Angela, if you're speaking. Yes, sorry, do you hear oh, me yes. now? Now is fine, yes, yes thank you. Um, I was curious about the dwarf galaxies that deviate most from the MV star formation rate relation for star cluster. Do you have uh, an age indicator? Um, so if you, yes, so you have a U and I band, so uh, how do you produce the V band? Uh, so we also, we do have a, a narrow, we have another uh, medium band V that okay. isn't in the three color image. So we do have a, a V band in there. 
Okay, so do you know if the, because I, I know some of these dwarf galaxies that deviate most, it's because their massive star cluster has formed, let's say 10, 15 million years ago. So then the star formation rate that we measure with H alpha, which is plotted here on the X axis, doesn't reflect the star formation that produced that massive cluster. Do you have an hint if this is confirmed with your sample? Uh, yes. So we have uh, the same, we're determining the star formation rate, as you say, the same way with the H alpha. And mm -hmm. the clusters that we find, the most massive clusters tend to be on the older side of our sample. So uh, I would agree that we don't, they're not representing the same uh, stellar population. Uh, but here I think the idea is that the star formation rate is just meant to represent uh, how, how large your galaxy is, right? To give an idea of what size star clusters you might have. Okay, thanks. Okay, Rohan. Hi, Sabrina, this is a great talk. I was curious for these dwarf mergers, do you have predictions for what their stellar halos should look like? Uh, in general, I'm interested in what fraction of stars in these dwarf galaxies end up being um, ex situ versus in situ. I was curious. Uh, that's a really good question and something I don't have the answer to, but we're um, in the process of trying to get really nice deep uh, optical imaging. Uh, it, including broadband and H alpha to try to answer just that question. Uh, because right now what we're going off of, we have some, some beautiful Muse uh, data, but mostly we just have Sloan imaging. And so we're trying to answer that question with some, with some deeper, more sensitive images. Yeah, that's a great question. Awesome, thank you. Okay, any last quick questions? Okay, otherwise we can put them on Slack and as Sabrina said, she'll be able to answer those as they come in. So thank you again, Sabrina. Yeah. Uh, we can move on to our next speaker now, uh, who's Sophia Fleury from UMass Amherst. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, as mentioned, I'm Sophia Fleury. I'm a third year grad student at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, I've been working with Ann Jascott and uh, uh, on the low redshift Lyman continuum survey. And for the, this conference, I'm gonna be talking about how some of our results uh, really paved the way for using James Webb to understand the galaxies at the epoch of reionization. So just to recap, many of you are familiar with the cosmic timeline for reionization already, but to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, recombination happens uh, here early in the universe. The universe cools, and the intergalactic medium becomes neutral, and that neutral hydrogen then uh, ultimately forms the first stars and galaxies, and those stars produce Lyman continuum radiation that then escapes into the intergalactic medium and it begins to reionize the intergalactic medium over the course of about a few hundred million years. And we know this happens because we see the gunn peterson trough and we see the Thompson scattering of the cosmic microwave background and such. So we really have a good handle on the fact that reionization happens and roughly when. But the really big question remains, uh, which galaxies cause reionization? And that's not something that we can just directly measure by looking at galaxies at a redshift of say six or, or 10 because all of the ionizing photons that are produced by stars in those galaxies get consumed by the neutral hydrogen during the actual process of reionization. And so we really need to turn to local analogs of high redshift galaxies in order to uh, understand which galaxies, which might be Lyman continuum emitters. And so that's where the low redshift Lyman continuum survey comes into play. Since we can't observe these galaxies at a the epic of reionization. We need to look at dwarf galaxies in the nearby universe. Um, unfortunately, they're uh, relatively rare, even, even nearby. And so uh, before this observing program, we uh, had only detected maybe uh, 15 or 20 Lyman continuum emitters. 
And so we really needed a comprehensive survey that would really explore the parameter spaces for uh, high redshift galaxies um, in, the, in the nearby universe um, with analogs. And <clears throat> in doing so, uh, the low redshift Lyman continuum survey has nearly tripled the number of detected Lyman continuum emitters at low redshift. And so uh, here I'm showing on the right uh, our detections uh, in the redshift space that uh, they span. And uh, this is just really exciting because now we have uh, a total of 50 Lyman continuum emitters that span a wide range of galaxy properties that allow us to uh, start testing diagnostics uh, that we can then apply to high redshift to really determine which galaxies are Lyman continuum emitters. Uh, just as a precursor to Alberto's talk, which is just after mine, uh, we do SCD fitting, and he was really the expert on that. Uh, we do SCD fitting <clears throat> for the non-ionizing flux in the HSD cost spectra to determine the, or infer the intrinsic Lyman continuum flux. And we can use that paired with the observed flux to determine the escape fraction Lyman continuum photons. From there, we need diagnostics. Uh, here I'm showing on the left two cartoons of uh, potential escape scenarios. Uh, we've either got this more isotropic escape where you don't have enough gas to extend out to the Stromgren radius, and so you get roughly isotropic escape of Lyman continuum photons. And then down here, I show the so this something referred to as the, the picket fence model where you have some optically thick gas and then you have narrow channels through which the alignment continuum can escape through this optically thin gas. And so really uh, this tells us that the line of sight optical depth is important for uh, <clears throat> determining the, the escape of alignment continuum photons along the line of sight. And the mechanism that drives this gas geometry is also really important. And so our diagnostics are going to rely on tracers of the optical depth and the corresponding mechanisms. So things like uh, feed observables like lamin alpha, the oxygen three to two flux ratio, and the star formation rate surface density. So the, the lamin alpha results for the LZLCS indicate that uh, there's a really good correlation between the lamin alpha equivalent width and the velocity separation of the, the peaks of the Lyman alpha profile and the escape fraction of Lyman continuum photons. And this tells us that the line of sight neutral hydrogen column density is really uh, well traced by the, the Lyman alpha properties. And then we can use these to infer the escape fraction. Uh, onto the optical depth, we uh, so oxygen three to two is thought to trace both optical depth and the ionization parameter. And I'm not gonna get into which one is the more likely case, but uh, we definitely see that there's a strong correlation between the, this uh, observed flux ratio and the escape fraction of Lyman continuum photons. And uh, then also the equivalent width of H beta, which is often an age diagnostic, uh, typically only works if you have a single stellar population that's dominating the flux. But uh, assuming that's the case, we think that there's a, a pretty strong correlation between the escape fraction of Lyman continuum photons and the, um, the age of a stellar population. So these very young, uh, young stellar populations are the, strongest or most prodigious Lyman continuum emitters. Um, on to uh, the more like mechanistic diagnostics, we see the star formation rate surface density and the specific star formation rate are both pretty strongly correlated with the escape fraction of Lyman continuum photons, which tells us that we really need uh, a lot of very concentrated strong star formation to facilitate the escape of Lyman continuum photons. And this also tells us that if we can accurately measure the, the specific star formation rate or the star formation rate surface density, uh, that can really get us uh, a good sense of which galaxies at high redshift are Lyman continuum emitters and therefore contributing significantly to cosmic reionization. Of course, the big question is now that we've had uh, the suite of diagnostics, we want to know how they actually extend to high redshift. 
And so uh, some preliminary pre-James Webb observations uh, at both a redshift of three and a redshift of seven can, can provide us a, uh, some early estimates of what our results might look like if we extend them to high redshift. So here I'm showing the low redshift Lyman continuum survey as these squares, and then redshift three observations as these circles, and then stars are the redshift seven galaxies. And the color coding is by the escape fraction. And obviously, as, as I said earlier, we can't actually measure the Lyman continuum uh, flux from these galaxies at a redshift of seven. And so we really need to figure out how to extend the results from lower redshifts up to, out to these galaxies. What's interesting is that the galaxies that we see at a low redshift that are the most extreme emitters. So these, these galaxies here and, and here, where we have really high escape fractions don't really appear to be coincident with, with many of the galaxies at redshifts of three or seven. And that these galaxies are more uh, associated with these, these weaker Lyman continuum emitters. Um, just breaking these down, these galaxies here that are very extreme, the, the high equivalent width galaxies, the very low stellar mass, high star formation rate, these are, these are galaxies that are, are green keys. And so these are very, very much uh, thought to be analogs of high redshift galaxies. But we see that at least uh, from these preliminary results, the galaxies that we do see at higher redshifts seem to be more akin to the normal star forming galaxies that have, uh, at least at low redshift, lower Lyman continuum escape fractions. And so the big question is then when we look at higher redshift galaxies, do we anticipate seeing these green peas in, in greater abundance than we have uh, to date? Or are these more normal star forming galaxies the, the culprits for cosmic reionization? And so this really begs the need for James Webb observations at high redshift to uh, populate the other diagnostics that I presented with uh, rest frame optical and UV observations to really determine which galaxies are most likely responsible for cosmic reionization. So to sum up, the low redshift Lyman continuum survey gives us the first really robust test for diagnostics to use at high redshift. Uh, we've got 35 new Lyman continuum emitters, eight which are particularly prodigious. And that brings the, the total of confirmed low redshift Lyman continuum emitters to a little bit over 50. And we find that some of the better indicators or diagnostics that we can use at high redshift are properties like Lyman alpha, um, the oxygen three to two flux ratio, um, H beta equivalent with the equivalent width of other um, nebular emission lines, the star formation rate surface density, and the slope of the UV continuum. We find also from these diagnostics some interesting insight into the nature of uh, Lyman continuum emitters, namely that uh, it seems like ionization and feedback are really both important for facilitating the Lyman continuum escape. Uh, from our preliminary comparisons with high redshift galaxies, we think that we see two different groups of, of Lyman continuum emitters that may experience different mechanisms, but we really need James Webb to explore this, uh, this parameter space at high redshift to better understand not only which galaxies are Lyman continuum emitters at high redshift, but uh, how they are leaking their ionizing radiation to then contribute to cosmic reionization. Great, thank you so much, Sophia. Um, we have some questions on Slack. Um, I'll go to the first one from, uh, from Jorot Mate. Um, it's great to see these results. Um, Jorot was wondering whether you investigated or are planning to investigate multi-parameter correlations to predict the Lyman continuum escape fraction with as little scatter as possible. Yeah, so that's something that's ongoing. Um, it's, uh, so we've done some PCA analysis, uh, but really one of the things that we've run into uh, that's a, a bit of a struggle is incorporating the upper limits appropriately. And so uh, we're still in the process of fleshing that out. But yeah, that's, that's a really um, important point. And I think that's really going to help us uh, improve these correlations. Okay, next question was from uh, Ayush Saxena. Uh, great talk, Sophia. Could the deficit of green pea type Lyman continuum leakers at higher redshifts simply be a consequence of a lack of observations for the very faint galaxies at high redshift? Uh, and then he comments that JWST will certainly help fill that gap. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, right now one of the big struggles is that green peas, um, with the exception of their emission lines, are relatively faint galaxies. And so there's some observation bias, at least at this point, and James Webb is, is hopefully going to rectify that problem. Okay, next one is from uh, Jens Melinde. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, based on the different diagnostics you've looked at, is the peak separation still the best single indicator for Lyman continuum escape? Um, that's that's a that's a complicated question in that we don't have velocity peak velocity separation measurements for all of our galaxies, and so while it's a very promising looking um, in terms of its correlation coefficient and just even visually it's a very promising relation, we haven't tested that as robustly as the other diagnostics, and so we can't say with the same level of confidence that that it's the best diagnostic, but it appears to be. Okay, uh, Renska Smith asks, uh, says, great talk. Um, just a question about how you measure the equipment width of both three plus H beta and the green peas. Do you estimate this over the entire galaxy or is it measured mainly over the brightest star forming regions from a slit spectrum, for example? Yeah, so these are, all these measurements uh, in the rest frame optical are done with Sloan spectra. And so at these redshifts, we're basically getting the entire galaxy. Okay. Um, I guess this will be the final question from uh, Kimihiko Nakajima. Thank you so much for the interesting talk. Uh, following from Ricardo's talk, uh, he's curious if you examine any trend between escape fraction and kinematic properties, for example, the presence of a broad component. Um, not yet, but that is something that would be really exciting to do, um, specifically because that would be related uh, poignantly to the, the feedback that we expect that would facilitate the geometry for alignment continuum escape. Okay, well, thank you so much again, Sophia. Uh, further questions can go on Slack uh, or in the breakout rooms later. Uh, so we can move on to our next speaker. Um, should be Alberto Saldana Lopez from Geneva. Yep, thank you. Um, let me share quickly this to you. Um, nope, I'm sorry, uh, I should be, you should be able to see the, the slides now. Yes. More presentation mode. So hi everyone, I'm Alberto, PhD student at University of Geneva. And today I'm going to present you some results of the uh, same topic that Sophia has uh, just talked before, the low red sea flame continuum survey. In particular, I'm focused on the ISM properties of these uh, low C lemon continuum emitters. So as we all know, it's a hot topic nowadays, this mystery of, co of co cosmic reionization. So we know that the universe was reionized around uh, six to nine. And we are now searching for the, uh, what we thought are the main contributors of this uh, cosmic reionization. Uh, of course, AGNs and uh, more, more massive galaxies have their own problems. So our hypothesis is that uh, more numerous, faint, and low mass galaxies can be the main drivers of cosmic reionization if their escape fractions are modest, like uh, 10 to, to 20%. I will explain uh, briefly in a moment. So, but the question is uh, how, uh, the question is if we can test our, this, our hypothesis. And uh, the answer is no, because we cannot uh, detect the Lyman continuum uh, red sea higher than four, for example, because we, are still some, we still have some intervening absorbers between, yeah, between the epoch of reunification and oh. us. That's what I'm trying to avoid. Good thing my video is up. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, we need the we need to search for indirect Lyman continuum probes. So we need to look at other parts of the of the electromagnetic spectrum to infer how many Lyman continuum photons we are emitting from this kind of galaxies. So there is a bunch of different uh, Lyman continuum proxies established at, at low C from uh, Lyman alpha emission up to uh, different uh, optical emission lines. And in this work, we are focused on using the UV absorption lines. Why? Because these uh, UV absorption lines, they uh, have similar ionization potential uh, than the neutral hydrogen, the, the neutral hydrogen and the, this uh, neutral hydrogen is the responsible of absorbing Lyman continuum photons. So we, we think that this is a good um, uh, indicator. Um, and the question now is, 
if we can truly infer some of the ISM properties and ionizing properties just looking at uh, UV absorption lines? And the answer is yes. So let's uh, imagine, for example, that we have a geometry, a galaxy with uh, this kind of geometry. So we have a central starburst here surrounded by a neutral gas cloud of uh, optically thick gas. So in principle, the Lyman continuum photons can also cannot escape from this kind of galaxy. And if we look at uh, low initiation interstellar absorption lines profiles, we will find that the residual flux, so the flux at the bottom of the line is zero. So these kind of uh, uh, least lines are black in principle. But now if we have some holes in the ISM of these, uh, uh, of these galaxies, uh, Lyman continuum photons can in principle escape. So we will detect Lyman continuum photons and more importantly, importantly the lower initiation species, they have now uh, non-zero residual flux at the, at the depth of, of the line. So let me uh, just introduce you a little bit of modeling. So for the same kind of geometry where we have a, a, a stellar radiation field, uh, surrounded by um, uh, clumpy ISM with different uh, neutral H1 gas clouds. And finally, we have a, a uniform, we assume that we have a uniform uh, a screen of dust uh, um, in front of the, of the whole geometry. Um, we can, one can write down the transfer equations for the flux that uh, emerge from this kind of geometry. And it's just the uh, intrinsic uh, flux produced by the stars times an attenuation term tam, times a term which is related with the geometry of the galaxy. So this covering factor fraction here, this covering fraction is just the, the fraction of line of sites that are covered by the optically thick clouds. So now if we divide the, the uh, emergent flux by the intrinsic flux, we end up with the escape fraction. So in principle, we can uh, predict the escape fraction only attending to the dust attenuation term ta times the covering fraction term. And this covering fraction term is directly related with the residual flux of the um, absorption lines. So uh, of course, nature is not so simple. So if you want to see a more sophisticated approach, I encourage you to go and read the Mauerhofer 2021 paper for more realistic uh, simulations on this. So uh, to study yeah, sorry. So to study this uh, kind of things, we use the uh, low red shift climbing continuum survey, which, uh, so as Sophia said before, is an HST large program co composed by 66 new uh, observations in the far UV and Lyman continuum uh, with the cosmic origin spectrograph. Uh, we select the galaxies from Sloan uh, plus galaxy photometry, having a wide range of, of different parameters like a high oxygen 3 to 2 ratio, blue UV colors, or high uh, star formation rate density. And we also include some archival galaxies by Isotope and Wang and collaborators. So at the end, our sample is composed by 89 Lyman continuum observations with uh, 35 new plus 15 literature uh, Lyman continuum emitters. So aside from the goal of the LCLCS, which is getting the first statistical sample of galaxies with uh, Lyman continuum measurements, the goals of this work is, uh, are to study the role of the ISM gas in the leakage of ionization radiation and also testing the UV lines as an indirect proxy of, of the escape fraction of galaxies. So to do that, we need uh, basically two things. The first that we need is the, to measure uh, or to infer absolute escape fractions. How uh, do we do that? So we, uh, first of all, uh, model the SED of every LCLCS galaxy with a linear combination of a Starburst 99 models, all of them attenuated by the same uh, uniform screen of dust. So these models allows, uh, allow us to uh, uh, infer how many uh, Lyman continuum photons intrinsically is producing uh, this galaxy. So now dividing the observed Lyman continuum flux uh, by the intrinsic Lyman continuum flux, we, we can uh, estimate the escape fraction. And uh, we also measure uh, consist consistently some UV lines. So we measure the equivalent width and residual flux of different uh, Lyman series lines and, and met other metallic lines. And here I show you some of the results. So uh, result number one, uh, Lyman continuum emitters tend to have weaker absorption lines. Uh, here I present uh, the equivalent width distribution for two lines, for a, a Lyman beta line and for silicon two doublet. 
and the dark uh, histogram represent the distribution for liquors, and the uh, li light histogram, uh, histogram represent the distribution for non liquors. So we can see how the liquors tend to have lower equivalent, equivalent widths. And this is also represented in these two panels where I uh, phase the escape fraction of, of, of every galaxy as a function of the equivalent width of, of H1 or uh, metallic lines. So result number two, the porosity of the ISM. And now remember the porosity of the ISM is, uh, 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 is so the, for us, the porosity of the ISM is represented by the residual flux of the lines. So uh, uh, yeah, the porosity of the ISM favors the escape of a Lyman continuum photons, meaning that the strongest emitters are found only with the higher residual fluxes in both the H1 lines represented here and the metallic lines represented here. Um, and more importantly uh, is that we can now compare the uh, spatial distributions of, of uh, metals and, and um, H1 gas attending to our covering fraction parameters. So here I, I compared the covering fraction of metals as, uh, versus the covering fraction of H1. And we can see that they are not uh, they are not following the one-to-one -one relation, but they are still tightly uh, correlated. So in principle, we could measure the residual flux of some metallic lines and trying to infer the covering fraction of uh, the H1. And finally, result number three, uh, the dust attenuation strongly impacts the escape of ionizing photons. So here I show the, again, the measure escape fraction as a function of the UV attenuation. And we can see how uh, they are strongly correlated and only the sources with low attenuation, they, they, are, they came up as stronger, stronger emitters. And also the scatter in this panel can be explained attending to different, uh, different covering fractions. So we do have now all the ingredients that we needed to infer the escape fraction of galaxies. We have measured the dust attenuation and we have measured the residual flux of different lines. So we can play the exercise. And here's the result number four. So here I compare our measure escape fraction. Uh, I compare these values with the predicted value that we can infer from the absorption lines, either using the H1 lines, and we can see that the correlation is very tight or using uh, the metallic lines. Uh, still, with the metallic lines, we still have tight correlations, but a bit more scattered. So our conclusion is that we can predict the escape fraction of galaxies on average only, or statistically. And I think I'm running out of time. We have applied this method um, already to a sample of high C galaxies. So, so we have compiled different uh, residual flux measurements and attenuation measurements of different uh, high C galaxy composites and other individual galaxies. And we can see how uh, this high C sample uh, have same uh, escape fraction that the LCLCS, but shifted to a uh, brighter UV magnitude. And finally, I will leave here the conclusions for you and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alberto. Um, we have time for questions. Um, first one on um, Slack is from Jens Melinde. Uh, very interesting talk. Uh, what extinction curve are you using for this? And does that choice have an impact on the results? Yeah, very good question. So for, uh, well, yeah, in this kind of uh, uh, fitting approach, we are using a ready 2016 extinction curve as a default. But we also try with SMC, and the conclusion is that uh, the, uh, since the SMC um, attenuation curve is, is steeper, we end up with uh, higher escape fractions than using the uh, ready 2016, for example. Okay, next question is uh, from Ayush Saxena. So thanks, Alberto. Uh, just curious if the intrinsic ionizing to non-ionizing UV flux ratio depends on the choice of stellar population models. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just, uh, this is something that we haven't tested yet. So we, so far we have uh, only tried with the St Starburst 99 models, but we are planning to uh, introduce now PIPA. So we'll see in a 
few weeks. Okay. Uh, Harley Cat says, uh, hi Alberto, nice talk. Can you discuss the impact of using a dust screen model with H1 with an H1 distribution that has a non-unity covering fraction? Uh, would you not expect the holes to be in both the H1 and the dust? Yeah, uh, good question, uh, Harley. Uh, yes, indeed, the other um, geometrical distribution that we can assume is that uh, is that the dust only resides on the H1 clouds. And of course, this is more physically meaningful, but unfortunately, our spectra are not enough. Uh, our spectra doesn't don't have enough signal to noise ratio to test the other geometry. So we prefer to simplify and use uh, the dust screen uniform geometry. But this is something that we will test uh, in stacks, for example, in stacking analysis. Okay. Uh, Xinping Zhu asks, uh, or says, thanks Alberto for the nice talk. Uh, on slide 12, the same residual intensity of absorption lines, there is a large scatter uh, in the escape of Lyman continuum. Do you know what the causes are? Yes, yeah, so we have some here, uh, here some outlier which are very, um, uh, with a higher uncertainties, but this uh, bunch of outliers here, uh, we think that, um, yeah, this, this super high uh, escape fraction sources, uh, um, the, maybe the interstellar medium is uh, completely ionized, and therefore uh, we cannot. Uh, yeah, if it's completely ionized, we don't have enough gas to produce the uh, metallic absorption lines, and therefore our picket fence models uh, may does not apply here anymore. But uh, this is here. This is something that we are still studying. Okay. So thank you for that. Um, if there are no last questions right now, uh, we can move on to the next speaker. So thank you, Alberto, again. Um, and the next speaker is uh, Rohan Naidu from Harvard. Um, just one second. Um, uh, visible, audible, uh, all, yep. the, all the Zoom uh, usuals. Yep, all good. All right, hello everyone. My name is Rohan Naidu. I'm a grad student at Harvard. Very excited to share some results about resolved Lyman alpha and how we're going to solve reionization with it. Uh, all the work I'm presenting today was done in very close collaboration with Yorick Mate. Uh, I have the great privilege uh, of being advised by Pascal Wush and Charlie Conroy. And the results I'm showing you here today. Uh... Oh, sorry, one second. Uh, I've been told that I've been sharing the wrong screen. Uh, my apologies. Okay, this should be better now. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, the results I'm sharing with you today are, uh, yeah, are were, were put together thanks to this amazing uh, XLS Z2 survey team um, that we had excellent support from. So to just set the stage a bit, uh, we are trying to understand cosmic reionization. And as the speakers in this session have uh, shown, everything really hinges on the Lyman continuum escape fractions. Uh, the escape fractions are the most uncertain parameters in our understanding of reionization. And we really want to nail them down because currently they allow for these very radically different scenarios. Uh, for example, if brighter galaxies have very high escape fractions, you get very late, very rapid reionization. Uh, and your reionization cheese, uh, namely the neutral gas and the bubbles within it, look radically different uh, compared to a scenario in which faint galaxies drive reionization. And the reason why progress has been so difficult with the Lyman continuum escape fraction is because direct observations are impossible at significant redshifts. And even at lower redshifts, the situation is complicated a lot by the stochasticity of the intergalactic medium. In particular, the state of the Lyman continuum escape fraction union is as follows. At lower redshifts, we cannot perform this very simple test of comparing leakers against non-leakers. Um, and this is this very simple test that we want to do, but we are unable to because uh, the situation is like we're sitting on an airplane and we're looking down at a city and we're trying to gauge how bright the city is. 
But unfortunately, there is a fog uh, that is enveloping the city. So we can't quite tell how bright the city really is. Namely, is a galaxy leaking, leaking Lyman continuum or not? And that is a fundamental impasse due to the intergalactic medium and these viewing angle effects that are really stopping progress. Another issue is that we can get rid of this IGM stochasticity by maybe stacking lots of samples or looking at individual special sources along fortunate viewing angles. But then it becomes really difficult to connect these results at low redshifts uh, to galaxies in the epoch of reionization. So we are currently lacking this framework to translate what we're finding at these lower redshifts um, all the way to redshift six, seven, eight. So what I'm going to try and convince you in this talk is that resolved Lyman alpha is really the solution to all our problems. The motivation for this is that Lyman alpha profiles are really excellent tracers of Lyman continuum escape fractions, as we just saw in Sophia Stock, for example. And this is something that's become very clear in the last couple of years. Uh, so in particular, the peak separation of the Lyman alpha profile, it seems, um, it turns out, traces the Lyman continuum escape fraction rather well. At slightly high redshifts, we see that a lot of prolific Lyman continuum emitters are also leaking a lot of Lyman alpha right at the systemic redshift with a very high central Lyman alpha fraction. Now, this is very powerful, right? So using these two properties, the central Lyman alpha fraction and the peak separation of these profiles, we can start teasing apart leakers and non-leakers for the first time very cleanly and very easily without uh, being subjected to the vagaries of the IGM and all these ring angle effects. And to do this, we rely on the XLS Z2 sample. So this is the X shooter Lyman Alpha survey at Redshift 2 led by Yorit. And this is the perfect data set for applying this Lyman Alpha profile based approach because we have uh, excellent resolution at the Lyman Alpha wavelength, excellent systemic redshifts. The sample is well defined. It is a luminosity limited sample. So it is really perfect for um, for understanding a very well-defined uh, selection that we can then extrapolate to higher redshifts. And because this is the magical X shooter instrument, we have coverage all the way from Lyman alpha to H alpha. Uh, so we can just look at all the features that lie across uh, the optical spectrum and the UV spectrum. So this is what our data looks like. So we use only Lyman alpha profiles, nothing else, purely Lyman alpha profiles to uh, select galaxies that are likely to be leaking Lyman continuum and those that are likely non-leakers. So you see these profiles have very broad features, barely any flux at line center, and so they're very likely to be uh, very poor Lyman continuum leakers. On the other hand, prolific leakers uh, have these uh, beautiful systemic velocity Lyman alpha that we're seeing. Lyman alpha photons are just rushing out of the galaxy right at the uh, systemic redshift without encountering much resistance. So what we do now is we produce stacks um, of these gorgeous X shooter spectra uh, based purely on these uh, Lyman alpha profiles. So both our stacks have comparable mass, comparable uh, MUV, comparable beta slopes, comparable metallicity. So the differences between them can't quite be attributed to these features. And again, we have coverage all the way from Lyman alpha through all these features, uh, all the way out to H alpha. So we can really like zoom in on differences between these leaking galaxies, galaxies that are likely leaking Lyman continuum and those that are likely non-leakers. So I'll zoom in on a few features that uh, should first inspire confidence that this approach is working, right? So we remember we selected purely on Lyman alpha line profiles. So then, when you look at the Lyman alpha escape fractions, that is uh, independent validation of what is going on. In general, we expect the Lyman alpha escape fraction to set an upper limit uh, on the Lyman continuum escape fraction. And it turns out indeed that the upper limit set for the high escape sources is much higher than those for the low escape sources. So that's an independent point of validation. Another is that these stacks differ very greatly in their dust content. So dust is what we expect uh, to be a key moderator of Lyman continuum escape. And we see very 
uh, very radical differences in the dust content of these stacks. So this is really giving us confidence that this approach is working. We also see very striking differences in some other proposed indicators of Lyman continuum escape, uh, namely magnesium too. So we see beautiful differences in the systemic velocity offset. So in the high escape stack, MG2 is escaping very close to the systemic velocity versus in the low escape stack, MG2 has struggled much more and it's coming out only at more than hundred kilometers per second. This is quite exciting because we plan to measure MG2 uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope very soon. And what we are finding is that this approach really has a lot of promise. Very strikingly, we also see really remarkable differences in the O3-2 ratio. So this is something that's been uh, debated quite a lot. Um, O3-2 is very promising because we expect to measure it very soon uh, in the epoch of reionization for order of hundreds uh, of galaxies right away in cycle one and with the ERS programs itself. And there's been a lot of confusion about whether O32 really traces Lyman continuum escape or not. And what we see is that when you make these stacks uh, using these very clean Lyman alpha profiles that bypass all these uncertainties that have helped, held us back till now, uh, like the IGM stochasticity and these viewing angle effects, you see this very, very striking difference in the O32 ratio uh, across these stacks, uh, giving us a lot of, uh, hope that we'll be able to do this with James Webb and really back out uh, a sense for what escape fractions are like in the epoch of reionization. We also pro produce estimates of what the escape fraction and uh, psi ion are of this sample of galaxies. And we find an escape fraction of about 50% uh, and a psi ion of about 25.9 for the leaker subsample. So about half our sample uh, that again is drawn from this very well representative a uh, well-defined selection function, uh, half of them have escape fractions of about 50%. And if these numbers seem very high to you, I want to emphasize that this is only half the Lyman alpha emitters at this redshift. And when you account for the very small fraction of Lyman alpha emitters at redshift two or three, the, these results are completely consistent with other independent methods of estimating escape fractions, like for example, with the Keck Lyman continuum circuit. Putting all our findings from these spectral stacks together, we assemble these evolutionary sequences for how Lyman alpha and Lyman continuum escape. So in your phase one, you have uh, massive stars that are still surrounded by their birth clouds. In phase two, they have blasted these channels through which we see ionizing photon escape. Uh, in phase three, uh, you see dust is starting to be produced and there's not as much escape happening. And phase four describes the vast majority of star forming galaxies at redshifts about two to four. So this framework really gives us a way of extrapolating to higher redshifts because what happens is that towards redshift eight or so, we expect the bulk of sources to be in these, uh, to be lamin alpha emitters and to be in these phase two and three. So this framework really gives us a language of understanding how the galaxy population is evolving as a function of redshift and what fraction of galaxies in which phases are actually contributing to reionization and to the ionizing emissivity. In my last couple of minutes, I just want to quickly motivate uh, a new framework of doing reionization calculations based on these results. So till now, folks have really used uv luminosity functions as the, as the bedrock for figuring out reionization for emissivity calculations. You take your uv luminosity functions and essentially convert them into some number of ionizing photons. But Lyman alpha luminosity functions are a much more intuitive choice for these kind of calculations. The most, the most intuitive reason is that the Lyman alpha escape fraction sets an upper bound on the ionizing photon escape fraction. So if your galaxy is not a Lyman alpha emitter, it is not contributing to reionization at all. So you're just summing photons from it, even though they are quote unquote unproductive. So one way I like describing this is that UV luminosity functions are summing photons from all and sundry galaxies. But Lyman alpha luminosity functions are really honing in on the galaxies that are actually contributing, the productive galaxies. So writing this down now, shifting from the classic formalism that prioritizes UV luminosity functions, we can move to a formalism uh, that really adopts this Lyman alpha based approach. And the only free parameters here are the Lyman alpha luminosity functions, the escape fraction of Lyman continuum photons, the escape fraction of Lyman alpha photons. And these are what we have estimated quite well now at redshift two. 
uh, from the XLSD2 survey and, this, and the results I was showing you just now. And it turns out that these redshift two findings can be extrapolated remarkably well into the epoch of reionization and to higher redshifts. Uh, and this for a variety of reasons. One is that lemon alpha luminosity functions and the fundamental properties of lemon alpha emitters are really quite redshift invariant. The lemon alpha profiles that we've uh, seen are intimately linked to the gas geometry and escape fractions are also redshift in invariant. And it seems that as you go to higher and higher redshifts, basically the integrals of your UV luminosity functions and your lemon alpha luminosity functions converge. In other words, at high redshift, every galaxy or every other galaxy is a lemon alpha emitter. So these constraints we've derived really apply to these populations quite well. And when you do the math, it turns out the emissivity from redshift two to eight is very well explained uh, by bright lemon alpha emitters by themselves. And what is really remarkable is that the flat shape of the emissivity which really is a very difficult constraint to match, really just drops out of this formalism very neatly, uh, even though the, star, the, the integrated rho SFR is changing by quite a lot uh, at these redshifts. You also get out very late, very rapid reionization by bright lemon alpha emitters. Uh, all you need to do is you need to extrapolate uh, what your lemon alpha fraction is like at these high redshifts. In particular, these upper limits here can be converted into numbers uh, based on some assumption for what your lemon alpha fraction should look like. Uh, and I point folks to Kit's talk uh, on ELGs later this week, which shows that uh, the evolution that we adopt is actually quite reasonable and an excellent match to what we're seeing for the evolution of ELGs. Um, I'll leave my summary slide here. Happy to uh, take questions and discuss in the, in the room later on. Thanks so much for listening. Good. So thank you, Rohan. Um, we have time maybe for one quick question. Um, I see one on Slack. Uh, so Jens Melinda asks, or says, thanks for a great talk. Are there any selection effects that may come into play here? For example, the training sample with line and continuum measurements you use might be biased in some way. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, and I'll point out that we don't really like do like a train, we don't really train in like a machine learning kind of way. We really like, it's more like taking inspiration and make these cuts in a very, very empirical sort of manner. Um, and what is really helping this whole business is that it's not just an empirical training set. This is also very well motivated by theoretical lemon alpha radiative transfer uh, simulations that really, uh, really like support the same picture that when you're seeing a lot of central lemon alpha, when you're seeing a lot of these narrow peaks, um, you really are seeing a uh, prolific lemon continuum escape. So when we make this division, we don't really like try and predict the exact number what your escape fraction is. We make very broad uh, cuts to just find galaxies in these very broad bins of uh, escape fractions less than 5% and greater than 20%. And that is something we think uh, is quite immune to any possible selection effects. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there's more questions on Slack for you to answer. Uh, and I think also now we're at the end of the session. So thank you to all of the speakers from, from this past session and also from all of today. Uh, we are going to start to share my screen. Um, we will have breakout sessions like we had in the morning. Um, and we also have, um, as a reminder, you can access um, the posters and recorded talks and, and interact with the speakers in the breakout rooms here.